Merce, can you hear me? Hola. Yes, hello. How are you? Very well. I have to go teaching in, in 20 minutes today. Oh, I, I oh that's to... when we start. Yes, I do. I will do my best. <laughs> <laughs> but will you after? Will you have the whole I'll, day teaching or? No, no. I'll come back after the at, at my ten thirty. So I'm teaching from eight thirty to ten thirty, and yes. then I, I I'll be able to to connect and and be yes. here, stay online. That's fine because eight thirty to ten thirty. What is it? Let's see. Nine nine thirty to eleven thirty in Greece. Yes, and that would be, where is it now? I have to check the program again. Here it is. Yes, I have it. Um, there is first, um, well, Patsy should say hello in about a quarter, so 20 I'll, I'll be there when you will start your talk. Ah, okay. That's that, good. That's 11, 11.30 that's 11 Greek yeah. time. So 10.30 exactly. my time. No, exactly. yes, 10.30 my time. And do we have a difference between you and me or not? No, 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 no. 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 You are okay. in Marseille. You are in, in... Yes, I'm in Marseille. Yes, yes, yes. And Barcelona, Marseille is the same. <laughs> Good. Okay. That sounds great. Okay. So you'll just be there for that one. Yes. yes. Nice to hear well, you. Well, I'll let you know if Saha is anything interesting. I can... Um, I can let you know. And anyway, there will be um, afterwards, they're, they're taping the whole thing. So we can always get the individual talks out. Mm -hmm. I can ask the slides as well. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Hello. <laughs> yep. Yep, yep, yep. Uh, somebody's. Uh... Oh, they're. they're... Yeah, I don't know who else it is. It is not really in the standard place. It's uh, it's somewhere in the center of Athens. Mm. You can see the building on top. Yes, yes, yes. You know, I was in, I met Panos in Athens two weeks ago. Yeah. Was, yes. <clears throat> you were there for holidays or? No, 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 there was a, a Gaia meeting. Mute the sound, yeah. We have to mute. Don't don't worry if you don't uh, uh, if uh, Mercedes not uh, can listen to you and the opposite. Yeah. We do tests here, so don't worry. Okay, okay, okay. okay. We yeah. just say goodbye and yasupano uh, and see you later, right? I can act so. <laughs> Can mute the mute. Then mute the mute. Then mute the mute.
So I think we can start. Good morning, everybody. The Research Center for Astronomy and Applied Mathematics welcomes the participants of this uh, one-day workshop, Spiral Bars and Galaxies, both those that uh, follow in person and are among us here, and those who join us over Zoom. Uh, welcome, everybody. We thank the Academy of Athens for providing this uh, nice room at the central building for the whole day. Uh, and uh, I hope uh, those that uh, you are not uh, coming very frequently here, you will enjoy that. Uh, as uh, Torsten remarked yesterday, it is like making a meeting, doing a meeting, having a meeting in a temple, <laughs> in an ancient temple. And uh, I have to say special thanks go to the friends and colleagues who came to the meeting from far away at their own expenses. I underline that. We thank Preb and Torsten Kanak and also ours, Christos, who come from the University of Padova uh, for this purpose. We appreciate it very much. It's uh, the only way nowadays to organize uh, meetings and workshops like that, that like this one. Uh, we are in uh, dire straits, as you know, and I feel obliged to apologize that we are not able to offer anything but coffee and cookies that you can find uh, at uh, the entrance here coming in during the whole time. You can go and have some coffee. Be careful uh, about uh, not making any troubles with the coffee in the room. We have been uh, uh, said to... To, to underline this as well. Uh, we, can, uh, we can start right away with the first talk, which will be from the talk of Professor Kondopoulos. We will give an overview of the subject and simultaneously will present the evolution of the ideas on the field. So Professor Kondopoulos, you may come. Good morning to everybody. My talk is about spiral arms in galaxies. And we know that it, in most galaxies there are spiral arms. But the problem is how these spiral arms are formed. Today I will present a historical account of the subject starting with the very first approaches to this problem, but emphasizing the density wave theory of spiral structure. The most obvious way that was considered to explain spiral alarms is by differential rotation. And in fact, the galaxies have a rotation velocity omega that is uh, decreasing with the distance. Therefore, the central parts of the, gal of the galaxy rotate faster. And if we start with an elliptical, let us say, form, then later on, we have the appearance of spiral arms that become very soon, very, very tight. And it was calculated that uh, if we go back in time, in the case of our galaxy, where we have a rather tight spirals, we should reach a straight line only 350,000 years, something that is very, very improbable. And in fact, if there would be such spirals, they would very soon become so tight that they would disappear. So this theory is not considered anymore. 
then in early years, Bertil Limblard in 1920s expressed a theory that was based to the instability of uh, orbits in a very, very flat galaxy. If we have very, very flat galaxy, the orbits in the boundary are unstable and matter is ejected in the direction of rotation. So this theory would predict a leading spiral arms. But uh, uh, first of all, the galaxies are not so flat in general. And uh, second, the leading arms are not supported by observations. So Lindblad later in 1940, 41, etc., developed the first density wave theory. He considered that the spiral arms are not material arms, are not composed of the same material, but they are the stars go through the spiral arms, but stay longer in the neighborhood of the spiral arms. And in this way, the, the spiral arms are waves that are continuously replaced by the motions of the stars, which as you see, approach the spiral arm, then change the direction uh, along the spiral arm and uh, then go to the next spiral arm. Uh, this theory was uh, realized, was applied in models by Miller, Prendergast and Quirk and also by Hall in 1970 and following years, and it was very, very obvious that the stars go through the spiral arms, stay there longer, and continue. But Lindblad made here a mistake which uh, did not support his theory. He noticed correctly that uh, the density waves can be trailing or leading. And that is correct, but uh, because he was preoccupied by leading spiral arms, he said uh, he would apply the theory to the leading spiral arms. And that was one reason that uh, his theory did not attract much attention, despite the fact that the, he preceded the theory of uh, waves in plasma physics that was developed later and uh, became very, very popular. But at that time, it was a very novel idea. I, I would only say that uh, in his last years, when his son, Perul of Lindblad, made some numerical experiments that always indicated that the spiral alarms are trailing, Lindblad, dirty Lindblad, changed his theory and his two last papers deal with uh, trailing spiral arms. And then came Lin, C.C. Lin. I met C.C. Lin in Boston in 1963 and he 
told me that he wanted to, to develop a theory of density waves. And I told him that uh, this theory has been developed already by Lindblad. So we went to the library and we borrowed several heavy volumes of the Stockholm Observatoriums and other where the theory of Lindblad was developed. A few days later, I, I met Lynn again and she said, I don't understand Lindblad, so I will try to develop the theory from scratch. And she did and developed the following theory with Lynn, Lynn and Shu, 1964, and independently, Kalnas, 1965, developed a very similar theory on this density wave in spiral arms. The basic idea is to use the most important equations for explaining this phenomenon. The first one is the Boltzmann equation. And F is the density in phase space, which is preserved. So the total derivative is zero. We have derivative with respect to the time, to x, y, z, and uh, to the potential, the partial derivative of F with the potential. Now, this theory is very similar, as I will show you in a moment, to the theory of the third integral, the effort of finding quantities that are preserved along the orbits of the stars. And uh, Except for we have all for this uh, equation, we have the density rho, which is the integral of f over the various uh, uh, quantities dx, dx, dy, dz, and also we have Poisson's equation, where this is well known. Well, in the cases that Lindblad uh, and also Lin, et cetera, considered at that time, they considered uh, uh, the, the wave on the plane of symmetry. Sigma is the density on the plane, and delta z is a delta function along the z direction. But this can be generalized. Now, if we have the potential, we can have an axisymmetric background, V0, and perturbations, V1, and the higher order perturbations in the potential, in the density, and in the density in phase space F. So we assume that the zero order problem is solved. So we have a symmetric galaxy. And then we have small deviations, V1, sigma 1, F1, that are given the linear theory. And then V2, etc., are higher order terms given the nonlinear theory. Now, in order to have sp spiral perturbations, we have V1 to be of this form. That is to say, we have a function of R, phi R, when we have two spiral arms, we have two omega t minus two theta, the angle. And 
this gives a spiral perturbation. But from the Boltzmann equation, if the potential is given, we can find F, the density in phase space. But then we have what we call the response density, sigma one response. But if we take the Poisson equation, we have sigma one imposed and the important condition is that the two quantities should be equal. And if we do that explicitly, we have an integral equation that gives eigenfunctions and eigenvalues in if we give the zero order potential. And that was done mainly by Kalnas. But Lin and Shu made an approach which included several approximations, and they gave the so called Lin Shu dispersion relation, which uh, as you will see, contains certain quantities that I have to explain. K, for example, is the wave number, and it is the inverse of the wavelength. Uh, the square root of R dot square average is the dispersion of velocities, and chi is a quantity that could, could includes again the same quantities. And the important thing is this mu, which is a frequency or rather a ratio of two frequencies, is two omega s minus omega divided by kappa, where omega s is the pattern velocity, omega is the angular velocity of the star, and kappa is the epicyclic frequency. Now, the orbits in the axisymmetric potential are rosettes, like the first curve here, and they fill a circular ring. And in fact, they are co these motions are composed of two motions. One is a rotation with angular velocity omega, or the rotating frame omega minus omega s, and the small epicycle, which is with frequency kappa, the epicyclic frequency, and the two together form the rosette form that we have here. Uh, in the particular case that this ratio is one, we have the third figure where we have a closed orbit, and this happens at the inner Lindblad resonance. So this is an important resonance. In fact, if we take the, this is this curve, we have, now, I'm sorry. This is here. What's going on? I'm to put you. We have a, the velocity omega in two models. In the first model, we calculate also omega and omega minus kappa over two. And uh, 
if this is equal to omega s, then we have the inner inverse resonance. In the first model, we dotted lines. There is only one inner Lilbrot resonance, while in the solid lines, omega and omega minus kappa over two, we have two inner Lilbrot resonances, and these are the most important, as we will see. We have also corrotation when omega is equal to omega s, and we have also further away the outer Lilbert resonance. I will not speak about that. Now, the lin Shu dispersion relation gives the value of uh, the wavelength as a function of new of this frequency or vice versa. And uh, you take the curve from u equal one, which happens at the inner Lindblad resonance, down to u equal zero, where we have correlation. And in fact, we have two solutions, one from one to one in the other direction, and the other one that is a very open spiral, as we will see, that is given with two equal one. Now this two is the ratio of the dispersion of the stars divided by the minimum dispersion that is given by Tubra. And uh, when two is equal to one, we have these two solutions, the tubular uh, minimum dispersion is the one that is necessary in order to avoid axisymmetric perturbations and instabilities. So, uh, the best, the minimum dispersion of the, the, of uh, velocities will, is when two is equal to one. When two is larger than one, we have the joining of the two solutions, and we have a curve like the upper curve here. If we apply that to a model of our galaxy, we have the two solutions for two equal to one. One is the tight spiral that I write here. And the second is a much more open that terminates at the uh, rotation distance but then it starts almost perpendicularly from the inner Lindblad resonance, which is the dotted curve, the dotted circle. So these are the two solutions, and they play an important role, as we will see in a moment. Uh, this theory was not uh, including the amplitude but this amplitude was calculated by Shu, and he gave all the formula. I will not give more details about that. Uh, at that time, when I was at Yerkes, I was discussing with Volcher and Chandra Shekhar the problems of the third integral. And Walter uh, argued that the third integral is valid only in cases where the potential is very smooth. 
very smoothly and the center all over the galaxy. But I insisted that this would be applicable to more complex systems. And the Volcher said, can you find a third integral in the case of a spiral galaxy? And Chandrasekhar was siding with Volcher, but then we had a further discussion with the law Volcher, and I convinced him that there would be a third integral, like the F integral that we have seen before, in the case of uh, spiral arms. And uh, the next day, Chandra Sekhar came to me and said, George, I am convinced that you are wrong and Vulture is right. And I told him, but you, Chandra, are an arbiter between me and Vulture. Now that we agree, Vulture and I, you have to agree, Vulture. You have no other choice. And in fact, we decided with Vulture to write a paper that appeared in 1964 that was the form of an integral that would represent a very rough model of spiral arms. You see, it was the same year as the Lin Shu paper. Then came a astounding the evolution of the theory. That was the group velocity by Tumler. And I will explain what this means. Uh, if we calculate by the lean shoe density wave, the solutions, in fact, we have many nearby spirals that uh, interact, that uh, combine and give a, a group effect. And in fact, we have a large amplitude between inner ring blood resonance and correlation and also beyond correlation towards the outer ring blood. But because of the group velocity, the whole pattern moves inwards to the inner ring blood resonance and very near the inner ring blood resonance, it almost disappears. And also the outer part disappears near the outer ring blood resonance. And then the Tubre calculated the velocity, the group velocity, that was of the order of 10 kilometers per second. But this is enough to eliminate the spirals in 10 to the 9 years. So it was a problem similar to the material arms with which I started today. Of course, it gave more time for the evolution, but not enough to explain the persistence of spiral arms. And then Tumer gave a theory how to overcome this difficulty of the group velocity. He said that the wave that goes very weak through the inner limbic resonance goes to the center and passes through the center and reappears as a leading wave. You see this first figure would have a weak leading wave. And this leading wave moves with a group velocity outwards and then it changes and finally it forms a very large and nice spiral. And later we have the same evolution, that is the spiral goes again inwards 
Peshtë të jelë ashtë të tërë shoshë, ishë guikër, në guikër, e në rritë, ishë e gjenë rritë të lënishë. Njërë korotejshën, we have local effects, të të ishë të shenë, if we have a density wave coming and forming an extra perturbation there, then the nearby stars are attracted by this extra uh, elliptical subject and uh, they form something stronger, which again forms the usual density waves. But it, uh, uh, Lin and Mark made another theory which was, if I would say, a variant of the previous one. That is to say, instead of a leading spiral coming from the center, they considered the trailing open spiral, as you see here, that goes outwards, enriches quotation, and then enhances the spiral arm that continues in this way. Uh, I may mention here that if we have approaches of other galaxies, we have tidal effects, and these tidal effects generate also density waves that are appropriate to the system, and that is to say they excite the eigenfunctions of the uh, axisymmetric background so that to form the new spiral arms, to enhance the spiral arms. But now I should mention the nonlinear phenomena. In fact, if we use the lean shoot formula, we find that it has a sine new pi, and when new is one at the inner ring, but resonance or minus one, then this denominator becomes zero. And we know that if we have a zero denominator in our theory of F, F, then the usual form of the third integral is not applicable. But then there exists another formula, another form of the integral, which is applicable to the case of the resonance, of this particular resonance. So the theory is valid, but we have to change the formula that gives the zero denominator. And give an idea of what happens near the inner Lindblad resonance. The first figure refers to an axisymmetric galaxy. We have in this diagram x and x dot uh, circular uh, orbits. Now, if we have the perturbation, the density wave perturbation, we have deviations of these curves, but when we approach the inner ring blood resonance, we have a second distribution that becomes dominant near the inner ring blood resonance, and beyond the, the first distribution on the right is eliminated, and there remains only the left distribution, which is different from the original one. So this phenomenon applies to the inner ring blood resonance. And in fact, we see that the 
uh, orbits formed two ovals almost perpendicular the one to the other. And we have seen also real galaxies where we have two oval distributions in the densities, the luminosity, I mean, perpendicular to each other. And then you see how also spiral arms are formed. Uh, the inner ring dot resonance helps also to understand the difference between leading and trailing waves. In this case, in the left case, we have a trailing spiral arm, as you see. It follows the rotation of the galaxy. And then in the inner part, inside the inner room that resonance, we have the thin line, but it is joined to the outer line smoothly. We have therefore a continuous uh, training configuration. But in the leading case, if the galaxy rotates in the other direction, then the inner part and the outer part are joined in a very strange way. They are joined by these thick lines and these are trailing. While initially the system was leading, nevertheless, the inner room that resonance turns it in such a way as to become trailing. Now, near the inner ring dot, and we have the inner part of the galaxy, and we have, we see here what happens in galaxies near the four to one resonance, where the galaxy, as we will see, terminates its spirals, but then in the gas, you can find extensions, weak extensions that are double, as you see here and here. And this also is seen in the case of a particular galaxy where we have spiral arms terminating essentially at the outer implant resonance, the four to one resonance, excuse me, and the AT densities are almost forming a square. In fact, we have the following. If we calculate the, the periodic orbits from the center outwards, we see near the middle of the resonance ellipses that are precessing, they change their direction. But when we reach the fourth one resonance, they become almost squares. Now, the precession ellipses support the spiral arm up to the fourth one resonance. But beyond that, we see again for a parallelogram, but the deviation of 45 degrees shows that we can't support anymore the spiral beyond the four to one resonance. Only in very weak spirals, and in especially in the gas, we can have extensions up to the rotation, but in most st somewhat stronger galaxies, we have the spiral arms up to the four to one resonance. On the other hand, in the case of bars, in the case of barred galaxies, we see that the orbits inside the rotation 
which is this circle, are along the spiral, along the bar, but beyond the collotation, the orbits are perpendicular to the bar and they tend to destroy the bar. Therefore, the bar has to terminate near collotation. In fact, in this case, in the bar case, we have two Lagrangian points, L1 and L2, and uh, their asymptotic curves, U and U, U, are going out of the Lagrangian points, while here we have the approach, the SR material approach in the L1. The U, U uh, line gives material that forms the envelope of the bar, while the motions along the spiral arms form trailing arms that go away. This gives the manifold theory of uh, barred spirals, where the spirals are for despite the fact that in this neighborhood the orbits are chaotic. In fact, in a previous paper with uh, Kaufman, we had calculated examples of orbits like that, which form the envelope of the bar to the center and the inner parts, at least, of the spiral arms. But later, Vogelis and collaborators have made the, a very fundamental discovery that if you take a galaxy and body simulations, of course, and we separate the ordered and the chaotic uh, orbits, the ordered orbits form only the inner part of the bar, while the, the chaotic orbits form the envelope of the bar and the spiral arms. And a similar conclusion was found by Romero Gomez and Nathan Sula in the same year. Now, Patches calculated the velocities of the orbits in a barred galaxy. And in this case, the velocities are along the spiral arms, as you see. And, but not, it is, they are trailing and not leading as Lindblad thought initially. Then came the theory of two pattern speeds that was emphasized by Selwood and others who made numerical experiments. And they wanted to find galaxies with different pattern velocity of the bar and another pattern velocity for the uh, spirals. And in this case, instead of the Lagrangian points L1 and L2, we have two almost elliptical periodic orbits, and their asymptotes form, again, trailing spiral arms. The rotation is to the left, but the spiral arms go to the right, the, the upper one. And in this case, we have, theoretically, spiral arms that have a different position in comparison with the bar at different times. They are not, as, as their velocity is different, they do not uh, emanate from the ends of the bar, but a little further. But this phenomenon repeats itself after one period. And so the 
sparrowlarms are found in all years. Uh, theoretically, we find the exact results, despite the fact that it was considered very difficult to find such solutions uh, in the case of two pattern speeds. I understand that uh, Dr. Simiopoulos will speak in more detail about these cases of two or more uh, pattern velocities. But I would like to finish with the following uh, remarks. First, that the density waves are of two types. The first is precession ellipses in normal galaxies, which terminate essentially inside correlation. And then manifold spirals that appear in both galaxies outside correlation and which are composed of chaotic orbits, but nevertheless, they form very nice spiral arms. And the second remark is about the theory of the manifolds near unstable periodic orbits. The main remark is the following. The third integral, F that I mentioned, is developed near stable periodic orbits. And the series that form this integral, F1, F0, F plus F1, plus F2, etc., etc., do not converge. But nevertheless, they give good approximate results that are important unless the amplitude is very, very strong. But in the case of unstable, periodic orbits, we have different uh, developments who are, which are convergent. That is a very strange result that was observed mainly by Moser and Georgini, etc. And in fact, we have the following. In the development of the third integral, we have the nominators of the form M1 omega 1 minus M2 omega 2. And if the range omega 1 over omega 2 is rational, then there are values of M1 and M2 that make this denominator zero. And if we are close to this configuration, we have small divisors. And because of that, the series that we form are not convergent. But if we have an unstable periodic orbit, then omega-1 is real and omega-2 is imaginary. I times the absolute value of omega-2. Therefore, the denominator is omega-1 M1 omega 1 minus I omega 2, M2 omega 2. And because of this I, you cannot ever form zero denominator or very small denominator. So in these cases, the third integral is convergent. And the limits of convergence have been considered in the following. Uh, work that was uh, in 1914, uh, 2014, and uh, I will mention one more final figure. In the particular case, we have curves that represent the third integral around the stable little orbit. At zero, at zero, we have an unstable periodic orbit. And if you take nearby orbits, nearby positions, 
Rusi dhe redi tots dhe parë shkatërt i në kaoti uaj. Pa të nevre bilesh, ku i take the actual form of the 13 degrel. In this case, we see that all these red points are along the asymptotic curves from the unstable period of Corbis. Therefore, we can, can find uh, the chaotic effects with the nevertheless can be given by formulas that are valid in the, the whole phase space. So I conclude by making the remark that the theory of density waves has been proved very useful and the recent developments with the theory of manifold uh, density waves gives new results that are of great interest. Thank you. Okay. Thank you very much, uh, Professor Kontopoulos, for the talk. Uh, all the subjects to be discussed during the day have been presented in a way here. Uh, let me see if there are questions in the audience. Uh, first of all, in the room, someone wants to ask something else, we can check. Uh, if uh, someone wants to uh, to ask from the colleagues who uh, can uh, raise a hand. Yeah, Kanak, yeah, yeah. Uh, well. So, uh, in the density wave theory, so yep. uh, in the density wave theory, But still you uh, allow the chaotic orbit concepts in that. So is the spiral arm stochastic in that? Yes. Yes, we do. Yes. So that goes as the same as what is called the stochastic theory of the spirals. Yes. Okay. Okay, thank you. Don't see anyone else uh, raised hand or something. If I'm missing something, then just speak. Can we hear the speak? Okay. Okay, then we can move on to the second talk of the day. So Kanak Saha will be uh, revisiting the spiral structure. So give us a few minutes to arrange the next talk. Uh, good morning. I hope I am audible. Um, I thank uh, Peno Spetsis for inviting me here and for organizing this uh, nice and close workshop. And it's been a, it's a pleasure to be in this, this, this setup. And uh, I also thought I'll come here so that I have, will have some opportunity to discuss uh, the subjects in an informal in way. So I mostly talk uh, that some of the end body experiments that I did um, during 
2010 to 2016. And uh, some of this uh, work um, was in collaboration with uh, Bruce Alma Green. Um, so the, I mean, I just wanted to say that, I mean, this is what happens when the giants in the field speaks. So it's almost every aspect has been touched. So, so we, I, I would go rather very quickly to, to the um, focused area where I speak, where I intend to speak. So I, I think this is um, just to get you started. Uh, that the spiral structure appears in 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 various of like the morphologies, and um, some are definitely with a bar, and uh, and the others are like without the central bar structure. And uh, there are two. Uh, um, uh, and if we look at um, look at the morphology, it also comes into your various kinds of morphology, starting from M equals to one to all the way higher order. And there are some interesting, um, interesting, uh, I do not know. So uh, this counter winding or anti winding, and then the anemic spiral. So, and the propellant spiral, these are some of the interesting, um, uh, features that generally are not being touched on. So most of the time we are still worrying about uh, the grand design spiral structure. Um, so if you look at the spiral structure, uh, try to go into the, into the very, very high red shift. So from the Hubble Deep Field. So there are questions like sort of our interest now is that when did the first spiral structure appear? if you go back in the universe. And it seems that uh, uh, based on 2014 work of Alma Green, Alan Green, that the onset of spiral structure probably uh, were between that shift 1.4 to 1.8. And if you can see the, the morphology of the spiral structure, they are not what it looks like in the local spiral. So very woolly and thick uh, like uh, spiral, spiral this. Excuse me, Kanak? I, I'm very sorry. I just think that uh, there doesn't seem to be any video of your talk coming through on Zoom. It's just a static picture of a Greek architectural structure. Okay, I can see the slides. Sorry for interrupting. Thank you. Thank you. Sorry about the disruption. So it, it seems that the, the onset of the spiral structure were uh, right when the, uh, between that shift 1.4 to 1.8, but then this hunt is still on and people still uh, try to look for like with a high, higher stretch shift spiral structure. And we try to, uh, if, you, if you look at this one, which appeared in 2012, and this is where the red shift around 1.18, and uh, so it's still like seems like uh, you can go back and still like look at the the, the spiral structure, and this exactly come into a like a very interesting question is to relate it with the Hubble sequence formation amongst galaxies, and uh, so so 
uh, the, the the and the spiral structure, of course, like uh, and the detection of the spiral structure uh, plays a crucial role in in this this formation of the Hubble sequence. And uh, I wanted to show um, this uh, the most uh, one of the recent paper from the Kudamote et al. 2022. It's where they found the if you see these are the the Spitzer observation, and if you look at the this galaxy here this looks like there are spiral structure and uh, interestingly these are um, the galaxies already made of the old stellar population so it seems the the, the spiral structure are there already at redshift 2. Point, this is around 2.4 and uh, it's already made up of the old stellar population so it, it seems that uh, the, the spiral structure, it's, um, I mean, it's until like now, I mean, higher and higher resolution telescope, like, you know, probably in JWS will find like you know, many more such cases. And we may see that the spiral structure, right, right, like right, even at higher redshift. And um, I, I think this, this search is on and it, what it what it means is that the uh, the there are the two question that comes to um, which is which uh, came out very nicely from the previous talk by Professor Contopoulos is that the, the the issues with the maintenance of the spiral structure and with the 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 the, the uh, that's a, that's also a, a question which is um, uh, was solved like you now by sort of proposing a density wave theory. And then Tumre sort of showed that, uh, he explained that the, the group velocity will disperse this spiral structure within, within a giga year time scale. So, um, so what, what, how do the spiral structure um, maintains, maintains its, its spirality in the, in the galaxies? The other, other, other question comes is you know, what excites the, the spiral structure? And that's when I thought I'd go to a few um, um, what excites the spiral structure. And uh, I would like uh, suggest, like you know, this is a very nice uh, review article written by Tumbre, uh, what amplifies the spiral structure. And it's already, it seems clear uh, now that the spiral structure of galaxies is a complex riddle without any unique entity answer. And so it shows that, that even after so long, we don't have actually a, a, a clear picture uh, uh, about how to um, create this diverse variety of the spiral structure, and, uh, leave aside the GAN design, and uh, uh, also like how to how to maintain them and on what excites them. This problem seems still on. It's like seems like a, a very old problem, but it's, it's still going on. Um, so typical in body uh, simulation. This is where uh, I cannot show the movie because it's a PDF file. Um, so if you, if you make an axisymmetric disk with a certain Thunberg Q, you would see that, that from an axisymmetric state, it forms spontaneously a bar. And, and then it, you see like there are the spiral structure comes out. And this, the such spiral structure do not um, stay long and uh, they just dissolve like as the disk is heated by the, by the um, during the evolution. And if you also look at like, the one can look at the spiral structure in, in the interaction. So, so um, and which creates a nice like grand design kind spiral structure. And again, the trouble is that as the perturbator goes away, um, uh, the, the, it's a, it still gets winded up. So the winding is, is, is an issue which is, um, which is, don't think it's been addressed well. How do I mean 
there's no, no good solution as far as I understand. Um, this is another uh, the piece of work by Elena Diongi uh, in appeared in 2013, where they uh, put in, in a coal disk. Uh, uh, these are like sort of star cluster, like you no know, point mass, and 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 uh, which is basically appears in the form of the GMCs, and uh, whether the GMCs when when they move. Each of these uh, GMCs, when they move, is like a point mass moving in a, in a field. And the point mass, when it moves in a field, uh, it, it's like a source of like an infinite, like you know, Fourier harmonics. So, uh, and then you have many of them, and whether, uh, whether, whether, whether there is an exciting excitement of this, like uh, the spiral structure in that. And you can see more or less what you get, like if the multi arm spiral structure, which probably driven by this GMCs. In fact, um, this is one of the idea, I think um, uh, uh, when I was in Taiwan, like you know, I had an opportunity to discuss with Frank Xu and he suggested also like a similar uh, problem. And you can see uh, the, how the GMCs could do that. Uh, and then uh, there's a, like tons of like uh, uh, work by Jerry Salute. And uh, here also like you know what Salute's like you no know, work comes out there as, 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 a, as a, an outcome of this. It seems like the spiral structures are basically transient spiral. So, so the simulations don't produce um, this, this long lasting sort of uh, spiral structure. And uh, there is a, uh, even in a recently, there is an interesting review by Salud and current masters in 2022. So, so what, we, what we try to do here, and very quickly I'll go the, here, is that uh, we did uh, a set of simulation in which uh, is purely in body collisionless simulation. And uh, the question that we asked, like, you know, could the bulge, uh, which is at the center of the galaxy, could have played a role in exciting the spiral structure? And uh, we know that there are. So, so the models that we are uh, built is based on Kuiken and Dubinsky 1995 model. And here, uh, it's uh, the N body model is based on. Uh, the distribution function approach. So well, we have the bulge made with the King's model and the dark matter halo. Uh, uh, the, there is a lowered Evans model, so like sort of very truncated. Um, and the stellar disk is an exponential disk with the, with the truncation. So this is the system has been solved self consistently, and one can create. Uh, uh, Sort of uh, various set of n body models, but then the trouble with this kind of model is that you cannot specify a um, given density. Uh, I mean, the parameters, for example, uh, which is uh, the, the measurable quantity, uh, um, because what goes as the input uh, is from the distribution function. But what you would like to have is from the velocity dispersion, the density, and everything. So, so it's a it's a it's a it's a bit of a difficult approach uh, where we do not have control on okay uh, how to create a given galaxy of so many de some such density and such velocity dispersion, rotation curve, everything. So it's it's a, it's a um, but I I I use them uh, to create a set of models. So here there are a set of nine models for which typically I show the rotation velocity here. And, uh, and this is where the omega minus kappa by two curve. And, uh, uh, and you can see there are some models which are, so what we did is basically uh, uh, the models having um, uh, low ILR strength to high ILR strength. Uh, in terms of uh, uh, introducing a bulge, which is like small compact to like you no know, the large bulge, and uh, each of these simulations, and on on this side there are like this is the tumbre cube versus radius, 
And each of these simulations had about 3.5 million particles. And this is where we, we, we see, I don't, uh, this is where we see this is on this side, there are these models here. Uh, this is like very compact bulge. And, and as you go to on, on, on this B6.8, 8.8, .8, there are sort of intermediate size bulge. And these are like large bulge. Like, um, and on, on the, on the, on the, you go from top to down is the time in, in, in terms of a giga year. So zero, four, six, eight, and seven, and eight giga year. You can see that obviously these are like surface density model. And uh, you can see that there are this like spiral structure forming and in, 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 in galaxies models where there is intermediate bulge where there. On the other side, very compact, bulges and all very large bulges you don't see like uh, the, the, this spiral structure appearing and this is where the 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 model with a b 6.8 where we have the spiral structure you can see the Fourier component versus this is radius and this is in time and you can see that the the, the spiral structures are there for like not quite some some time at least about four giga year Sorry, I can't show the movie. So what we thought is that is that this is where the 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 Q versus the radius. So this I think well, what we thought is that the ILR is ILR peak will be somewhere here. Okay. So it seems like in front of the ILR peak there is like this Q barrier. Okay, which is proposed by like you no know, mark basically. Okay. Uh, there are a series of like no papers by like no more. It seems like the the, the this spiral structure or uh, this the, this is uh, basically the 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 Q barrier uh, hypothesis the put forward by uh, the mark to to create uh, this this like spiral structure. And in our simulations, we see exactly that the that that in front of the ILR peak there is this Q barrier in which allows to like you know, reflect off and create a spiral structure. And in this, if you, if you, um, I just, so uh, in this, if you see that the, the, the spiral structure seems to be confined with, within the four to one resonance. And, uh, and this is where the, the, the phase angle of this spiral structure for, for one of this model, which is 6.8. And you can see from two to around, uh, about six giga year or 6.5, there is a, the phase angle, or the, or the, sorry, the pattern speed is, is like remain like no saying. So, so this is one of the, uh, the, the, the way like we can, we can see the, the, the density wave kind of picture for, for this, this spiral structure. Uh, and you know, which is, which is, I think, I think goes along with the, with the, the Q barrier hypothesis. And uh, this is where we show the bulge to total ratio and the spiral amplitude. And uh, these are at different time, eight, seven, and six times. And, and you, can, you, can, you can see that there is a like a bulge to, this is sort of intermediate size the bulge, which where the spiral amplitude in this case uh, seems to be sustaining for a long time. And uh, the same goes with the the, the, the ILR strength here. So this is uh, this is a, uh, this is uh, this is the work like you now what we what we show here that the Q barrier and can can do the density wave magic sort of in in in, in body experiments and this spiral structure all of them like you now in. in or five cases, we they seems to be confined within the four to one resonance. And this is the the uh, familiar like the frequency versus the radius, and where you can see that that spectral like uh, uh, the the power the power in the in the, in the Fourier modes. 
So um, be up beyond this, so this this work was of course like is published in in 2016 in Astrophysical Journal, and then I think uh, we I try to do explore a, a bit more, and many of these things were not published. Uh, so um, so we can we can we can I I thought like and I'll still like you know, do a bit of a discussion on on. So um, we made, uh, I made like several like you know, N-body models in which this is the familiar Thumre Q. This is the, the swing amplification parameter. And I also explored with the uh, like you know, various, the velocity ellipsoid, shape of the velocity ellipse. So what we wanted to like you know, look is that, is that could this be that the, uh, I mean, although spiral structure is uh, predominantly 2D phenomena, so, so you you don't um, there's not much of a vertical coupling. So, so whether whether it's in the um, you see uh, the spiral structure, whether there is uh, yeah, in the reflection in the in the dark matter halo, and see something, but I think uh, um, we lack the. I did not continue this work and. Uh, there seems to be some reflection in the, in the, in the dark matter halo in the, in the. This is purely the spiral structure. It's, um, uh, this is, of course, like in the old. I don't know. So there's another um, sort of explorations which I did. This is about the 30 simulations we have performed. And um, in these simulations, you can see like you know, there's a widely varying parameters, but there is something interesting here, which is basically related to the velocity ellipsoid um, in, the, in, the, in, this, in this galaxies. The question is, um, uh, first of all, um, first of all, what is the, the, the favorite velocity ellipsoid in, in a galaxy? Like, um, start with uh, what we can measure today. So uh, most of the cases like you know, we see that the velocity ellipsoid in a, in a, in a local galaxies uh, seems to be like an you know, object. So it's a sigma Z over sigma R is sort of less than like one. And a uh, uh, question is like, is that, is that an effect of that on the, on the, on the, uh, on the evolution of the, the galaxies. So uh, this is where it's, it's in the Thumbre Q and uh, this is the swimming amplification parameter. And the, this is colored by the sigma Z over sigma R. i sorry, like if you cannot see this, but so we made, I made this are like several models at T equals to zero. And there are like a set of models where uh, a very high swimming application parameter and also Tumbre Q very large. So you don't expect them to oh, form spiral structure because so most of the cases, what has been shown is like the, the X parameter should be like no less than two. Um, so you don't, you don't expect, but then they also have um, the, the velocity ellipsoid seems to be prolite. So, and I looked at their evolution in, in one of these cases here, it's, uh, this is where the sigma Z was sigma R versus time, okay? And at this, at T equals to zero, two, four, and so on, okay? And you can see here um, is that uh, it starts with an, of course, we have an axisymmetric model and, um, and this is where the, the velocity ellipsoid evolution. Okay. Um, so I don't have all the plots from the from the 30 simulation just for an illustration. And what I what I saw is that we start with the like you know, the prolet velocity ellipsoid. Um, they of course like you no know, become um, Oblate velocity ellipsoid because the, the it's a the the because the spiral structure uh, do not do a lot of vertical heating but it will do radial heating 
So the sigma r will change. So the uh, radial velocity dispersion. So, and then, so over time, you would expect this prolate velocity ellipsoid to be flattened and become spherical. And then it's kind of become oblate. If it is a spiral structure. And in, in, in this case, as long as the velocity ellipsoid seems to be like sort of near spherical or prolate, uh, uh, on, on, on those cases, they seem to be like, uh, 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 like large uh, parallel structure seems to be. Um, uh, there is like, of course, like you know, if you have a bar, uh, then you can even if it is like because the bar does like you know the vertical uh, the you know, efficiently vertical heating. So in this case, we don't see the the, the this parallel structure. It seems to be lost to one of the. So, so this this exploration sort of like lead to um, sort of this this picture, uh, but um, I don't know. I have not like you know, done done further on on this this, but this seemed to me a, a very interesting uh, direction in which we could see the the sustenance of the spiral structure in general by the by the. But remember, like no, this is these are also the case where you do not expect the spiral structure to be forming because it's a very hot disk and also like you no know, last. You know. um, so there are there are um, there are few others like you know, explorations which I did in terms of a low Q. Uh, did this. Um, so the, I did like you know, see a few um, uh, simulation in which you um, we we started with a very cold tumor Q less than one, and so but it has like a very um, a large dark matter halo in this, and you can see like from all t equals to zero to every two hundred, and you can see the how the disk the density distribution evolves. And uh, very surprisingly, uh, this seems like the case of anti-winding. Uh, instead of like what you uh, heard that as soon as it creates spiral structure and it gets wound up, right? Because of the, the shear and all, all that like, part in the, in the first talk. And you can see very clearly here, you can see it's like, seems like opening up here. From, from 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 initially, if you like, you know, follow, and it's, it seems like you know, opening up. For this is this like few giga years here, uh, in in terms of like the simulation times. Um, uh, this was a very very surprising, and, and I thought like I'll share with you here. This is another case of anti winding here. Uh, this is also like you no know, low Q disk. You can see it starts with like uh, seems like this, the, this anti winding of the, of the counter winding case of a, the, the spiral structure. And in this case, you can see there's a like, and also also in this case, you can see that they are quite wide open actually, unlike the case of a. Uh, um, Case of a two, uh, the Q barrier where we could sustain the spiral structure for long, but then the spiral structure seems to be more um, winding up basically. And but in the, in this in these cases, you see uh, it's much more open uh, case. Um, so so in 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 in. Oh yeah, so so exactly. So this is this is where I think I I, I uh, these are like sort of my new explorations, and I think I would be good to talk about this and discuss. We'll stop here actually, close to the end. If there is questions. Uh,
Hi, Connick. This is Peter. I, I had a, a nice talk. I had a brief question um, when you were talking about changing the bulge size relative to the disc. And you said that on one end of the models, the bulges were more compact, but your title says bulge to total ratio, which is different. So are the bulges on the, in the left-hand models, are the bulges physically smaller relative to the disc, like half-light radius smaller, or are they less massive or some combination? So Peter, um, the bulge to total ratio does not include the dark matter halo, first of all. So it's bulge to disc ratio, if you like, like in that sense, like, like the way the observers measure. Right, but my question was, for instance, the, the left-hand models, does, is, is the bulge to total stellar mass ratio, is that smaller than the models on the right? Or is it the radius of the bulge relative to the disk that changes or some combination of the two? Uh, so this is where the bulge masses are. This is in 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 in, in body unit. So, so it's actually the the mass of the bulge, which is which is the the case. But I think um, the effective radius is also should be involved because they are also going to. So I think it's a, it's a combination, Peter, because this is not absolutely just the one parameter, but. Yeah, I, I should look at it, but it's a it's a combination. But as far as I understand, like if you have a ch changing the the bulge mass here, there's a like the, also the effective radius is is not kept constant because that does not come as a free parameter which we could control in the simulation. Okay, thanks. Yeah. Yes. Uh, more questions here. Someone from Mirella, Arsula. Well, thank you for your talk. Uh, I would like to ask for the case of the anti winding problem that you have uh, seen in your end body simulations, uh, that they become less uh, tightly wound with time. Uh, have you checked that this is a realistic uh, scenario by, for example, comparing with uh, spiral galaxies in uh, bigger redshift if they are more wounded the the arms if uh, if if someone can uh, observe this uh, phenomenon if you go to larger red shift they are more tightly wounded than in the smaller red shift local galaxies you mean hmm? um i mean statistically i mean can you have yes, a i think um... well the, the only one case we know is about red shift like 2.2, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. they seem to be like sort of open, much, much more open, but there's only one case. So, so it's hard to probably, I think we need time. It is a very good, like, you know, it's a problem. I think people should look at this. AWST now. If you find, of course, so it's only one case and it seems to be open. So if you look at actually the, Yeah, you see here, quite open. <laughs> well, it seems like uh, in the in many end body simulations, there is an initial three arm, uh, three arm period, and maybe this is what uh, got it at uh, that stage. But yes. uh, if you uh, when do you think that uh, structures like what we have in the nearby universe are established? If you, if you have some grand design spirals, so from your simulations, how long would you say that it takes until we come to that stage? After how many years or? 
I mean, you mean from from this? From whatever the simulation is again. Based on the few cases that I studied here, it seems like it should not be more than more than a year. I, I did not see any case in which uh, a constant pattern speed, which we measure actually, mm -hmm. were observed for which born beyond the duration of more than four giga year. Okay. It appeared at all. So so it. it I mean, there was no cases, for example, the the, the warm spiral, mm -hmm. which I produced here, and with a constant pattern speed that lasted for more than four giga year. Okay, that's too much. Yeah, but if you can find something like yes. that. It's but, uh, but these are, remember, these are also um, also pure collision-less simulation. The stars. Oh, well, like, I, I would say even better than because we don't have uh, something to to regulate the dispersion of velocity, etc. So yes, it seems there are there are some studies where um, analytical work been shown that uh, if you look at the this uh, group velocity mm -hmm. and disperses the spiral waves within a giga year, um, that time scale seems can go by a factor of few longer. Mm -hmm. If you add coal gas into the, yeah. but well, the analytic, I do not know. Okay, well, I, I have another question about the bulges you mentioned. So you start with a bulge, so with an axisymmetric component, right? But how long does it stay axisymmetric? I mean, at least after a while, wouldn't it turn off, uh, turn on to? Uh, a kind of what is an oval distortion or something like that. So can we speak about a weak bar being developed? But um, and in that case, can we? Yes, but this is a this is a this is an interesting problem, and of course, like a very interesting question. But to answer this thing, I would go to um, some of my simulation. So we did actually look at this problem. Um, uh, so if you have an axisymmetric bulge, first of all, it gets flattened by the disk gravity. Mm -hmm. It's no more like a real, if you put in a real spherical like uh, bulge in the, in the axisymmetric disk, the disk gravity, it's flattened. Mm -hmm. Now that's an effect of, we cannot avoid that. But uh, you can uh, look at the um, city structure in that. And uh, unless you interfere the bulge stars with an existing uh, non axisymmetric structure. Mm -hmm. So be, the, the, you, you, you can imagine, like, you know, with time, the spherical distribution would not become a non axisymmetric in any way. That is very unlikely. Okay. So it has to have some interaction. For example, there can be uh, angular momentum transfer. For example. The ball stars are participating uh, through some angular momentum infusion, either let's say uh, post spontaneously forming bar, or I do not know if the, the if a, if even these transient spirals can do that. If they do that, then you can expect that can change the sort of shape of the of the bulk stars, the distribution at least. I see. Right? I see. Otherwise, you can have a axisymmetric case, no non-axisymmetric, bulk stars would not change, I feel. I mean, simple body. I mean, that's what my feeling so, is. Yes, Preben wants to ask something. Just a word of warning. You were showing a number of K-band images in the stats. Now, uh, they are significantly affected by young stars, and therefore one cannot translate K even K-band photometry into surface density. That is a very dangerous matter. Sure. Well, the distribution of, uh, of the young objects is yeah. a pain, of course. Uh, in the audience, there is uh, 
Nobody else look at him wants to ask one something. One. Uh, if there is one of uh, the participants that are over Zoom, please uh, just uh, unmute and speak. Uh, we cannot uh, just check that one. Okay, okay, this works. Hi, it's Enrico Maria here. And good morning to everybody. I have, I have a question about the, the shape of the ellipsoid, Kartik. And you show that sometimes they could be prolate. And my question is, do you have any prolate ellipsoid at the end of the evolution of the of the galaxy? Or no. Only at the beginning? Uh, only in the beginning because uh, it's hard to create, hard to maintain the prolate velocity ellipsoid because, as you know, uh, even uh, during the evolution when the the... Even the transient spirals will do some heating. So the heating would change the, the sigma r, which is the radial velocity displacement. The prolate would get flattened. In the, end. the question is like, how long can you keep that flood, the, the, the heating to be like sort of in a low so that you keep maintain sort of not prolate, at least spherical? But I, yes. Will not it will not remain as polite at all. Okay, thank you, thank you so much. So, is there any other question? If not, then we can go again and. Uh, the next speaker is Lea Thanasula. This will be one talk that will be from Marseille. We have to do some technical arrangements. And I propose that we do a small break here. And then we continue in a quarter of an hour about with the talk of Lea. Okay. So okay. give us some time. So Lea, we arrange everything here and then we start uh, in 10 minutes to a quarter. We'll be in touch. Ano? Sería de lo mejor. Sería de lo mejor. En bros, ¿me acude? Acúme, Lía, ¿no? Εντάξει, τώρα κανονικά ε, δεν έχω την δυνατότητα να βάλω ε, να κάνω το το τι το. το αυτή την ομιλία. Κοίταξε, μπορώ να κάνω την ομιλία, αλλά δεν ξέρω πώς, όταν ήταν, έβλεπα, ας πούμε, το αυτό και τώρα έχασα τελείως την, το link και δεν ξέρω πώς να το ξαναπάρω. Εσείς βγάλατε κάτι εκείνη την ώρα. Πού λένε, αυτό είναι μέσα. Είσαι μέσα, είσαι άρα στην τρεμένη. Άλλο παρά θα σου δώσουμε. Στάσου, ε, τώρα τι βλέπετε εσείς. Βλέπετε το, 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 το τίτλο και το όνομά μου και τα λοιπά, collaborators. Δεν βλέπουμε την οθόνη σου καθόλου. Ε, αυτό σου λέω, αυτό χάθηκε. Υπήρχε μέχρι ένα σημείο αυτό το πράγμα. Στάσου τώρα να δούμε τι θα κάνουμε. Γιατί πρέπει να ξαναγυρίσω κάπως. Uh, well, I can't anymore share screen. That's the point. Um, Τώρα είσαι host, Λία, οπότε... That's what I'm trying to find. Well, it's just... It's in the... Here. Uh, here. Here. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Share screen. Yeah. Yes. And share screen is... Is not these. Ah, here we are. Can you see anything now? Uh, yes, we can see. The, we have the, your transparency, your slide uh, in, the, in our screen. It's perfect. Yes, so control L to make it. Uh, well, which it doesn't do. Um, I can't make it have full screen. View. Yes. Full screen mode. 
yes, now you should see, should be seeing it better. Great, because here we lost everything. <laughs> oh. Mm -hmm. uh, so this back. <laughs> Back in the previous situation. Okay, the only thing that we see is the R. What was the last R? Yes, and the three uh, follow dots. I can hear you very badly. It, I, the, 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 the voice is intermittent. Με ακούς τώρα, Ελία. Ναι, πολύ καλύτερα. Ωραία, ωραία. Λοιπόν, είχα κράτα κάτω μικρόφωνο, είχα ξεχαστεί με το μικρόφωνο στα χέρια. Α, ναι, άμα το κρατάς αγκαλιά. <laughs> Ωραία, τώρα είμαι κοντά, τώρα είμαι στο πόντιμο, αλλά ε, εσύ μπορείς να μας βλέπεις. Ίσως εμείς βλέπουμε αυτό, έλεγα, μόνο την μπάρα απάνω, που λέει τον τίτλο της ομιλίας. Ναι. Και, και τίποτα άλλο. Οπότε... Oh. Ναι, τίποτα άλλο. Τα άλλα είναι μαύρα. Βλέπουμε ένα μαύρο πλαίσιο. Είναι σαν κάτι να μην πηγαίνει καλά με το βίντεο, δηλαδή. Κοίταξε, εγώ που το βλέπω, το βλέπω πολύ καλά. Το βλέπω, Ο... δηλαδή, έκανα να είναι full screen mode. Ναι. Στάξω να τη βγάλω τη full screen mode, βάζει και... Επομένως, ξαναγύρνα πίσω στο... Να yes. ξαναγυρίσω πίσω. Εντάξει, στάξω τώρα. Περίμενε, περίμενε. Uh, they want to get out, me to get out of the full screen mode. And now I don't have it anymore. We go to the, back to the Zoom. Back to the Zoom. Yes, sir. Yeah. Yes. And then, yes. Um, okay. Share screen. Όλη την οθόνη, όχι μόνο την ομιλία, οπότε θα δείχνει τα πάντα. Για προσπάθησε αυτό. Έγινε αυτό προκαιρού. Και βγήκε μετά μόνο η ομιλία. Sorry. Show manage participants. Show chat. Show floating meeting controls. G4. Okay, well. That is not, that is Firefox. This is you don't need. I don't need that. Okay, yeah. sorry, sorry, sorry. Uh, this one. Yeah. Okay, I don't have anything else. Yes. And then, how do I get now out of this in order to not to make it? Ah, Control L. Yes. What was the? Um, yes. Ah, Escape. Escape. Yes. That was it. I remember. Problem. Τώρα είμαστε πάλι στην κατά στην προηγούμενη κατά. Δηλαδή έτσι γίνεται η ομιλία. Απλώς βλέπουμε και το ότι έχει δεξιά. Ναι. Έτσι να κάνουμε. Ας τάσουν δύο λεφτά. Μπορώ να το κάνω και αλλιώς. Περίμενε δύο λεφτά. Αν βγάλω αυτό έτσι. Και κάνω αυτό έτσι. Άρα είμαστε. Μια χα... ε, χάνουμε λίγο κάτω-κάτω. Α, ναι. Λοιπόν, στάσου να δούμε τώρα τι μπορεί να γίνει. Ωραία. Εντάξει. Ε, στάσου, ε, όχι σωστή, σωστό, όχι τόσο πολύ. Ε, no, I just, you know, it, they can't see the collaborators, so they can't see the end of the picture. Please take it. Uh, yes. Okay, now you can see everything. Now it's perfect. And okay, yeah, there's a little bit of gray in the in the end, but I mean, you know, you have to live with it. If we start making it more complicated, we lose okay. everything again. Uh, I agree. Let, let's have it like this. Uh, it is, yeah. uh... and let's see the whether I do move. Yes, I do move. Yes. Whew. So uh, give us uh, five to ten minutes until uh, I collect people from uh, outside. For okay, the... give me five or ten minutes. I go and get some water. Okay, great, great. So in five, ten minutes we are here. Amen.
Hello? Hello? Could be they lost sound, I don't know. But wait and see. I know, I mean, they switch it off. Oh, yeah. Yeah. They will come back. Yeah, they miss Kati. Yeah. Όχι, ήθελα να δω μήπως, γιατί δεν, για, για καιρό δεν άκουγα τίποτα, ήταν ένα τελείως λευκό, ας πούμε, και έλεγα μήπως έχω χάσει εγώ κάτι. Έχει, έχουμε κάνει mute εδώ πέρα απλώς το Α, πότε... Κανένα πρόβλημα, κανένα πρόβλημα. Σε πέντε λεπτά και θα... Κανένα θα... πρόβλημα πάνω μου, κανένα πρόβλημα. Ωραία, ωραία. You know, people had to. Why can't we almost faster than? Huh? Almost faster than. Well, they started earlier because uh, the founder said for the introduction uh, on fifty, he needed only fifteen minutes, and then uh, yeah. uh, I think uh, George was in time and uh, um, Sarah was in short. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. Sarah okay. Was 
sound was 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 just a mm-hmm. less less dense and interesting. You got what you did. Yeah, it's a, George is still doing well. It's good. Yeah. 95. Yeah. 95. Yeah. It's just not bad. Yeah. No. Yeah. You have to be good about that in 95. Yeah. yeah. No, that was much less than that. We still have stuff to be done. So, so. Yeah, we had a. Nobody had a tough time. Yeah. But at some point he had no dark matter at all. Yeah, but he showed uh, the bits with the with dark matter. Yeah. 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 No, no gas. Yes, of course. There's plenty more here. Okay, yeah. One at all. Just in case. There's a question that is of interest. Yeah. Yeah, 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 yeah. Did. Oh. Oh. Oh, they're coming. Oops, what was that? Oh, it's an email. Oh, oh. No. So, it doesn't, it doesn't anyway. Mm. 
Yeah. It goes faster. Yeah. We're coming back. Continue. Yes, I can hear you. Okay. Very nice. So everybody is in the room. I see. Okay, then we can start. So the next speaker is Leah Athanasula. So the uh, we overcome the technical difficulties we had, and we are ready to start a new approach to the formation and evolution of galactic disks and of their structures. Okay, Leah, please go ahead. Thank you, Bano. So um, when a theoretician wants to do, um, to study like the, form the formation of a structure like a bar or a spiral or something like that, well, what they will do is to start with a disc which is as stable as they can make it. That is, um, they first try and get this stable disc and then they look at what the structures do. Now, if that is the case, it, it is it is very reasonable thing. It's a very good thing to do because otherwise, if the initial disk was unstable, then the instability which causes the bar, for example, and the instability of inherent instability of the disk would mix, and you would be we, and anybody would be unable to actually sort them out. What is what, and how does it go? So, on the other hand, if one says uh, Yes, I will just get started with just this. Um, this is the standard approach. Just get started with an with an fully stable disk. Then there are two problems. The one is perhaps mine, but I don't know. I feel very bad. But the bar has to wait for the disk to grow fully, and only that then say, "Oops, I should be growing," and start growing. It's just not reasonable. It's just not physical. And then that one, the whatever disk, this is the first thing that I don't like. And the second thing I don't like is that if the parameters, the, you need parameters to make a disk, right? And those parameters are necessarily ad hoc. So why take this and not that? And why, how do you couple those things? Um, so I was, whatever you, um, Whatever I did, I mean, I, I, I was confronted with those problems and all the work I did a long time ago what is confronted with those. But then I thought, well, let's look at things a bit differently for a totally different point of view. Well, we know that when the, well, it's a very simplistic picture, the, when the galaxies form, they initially bump into each other much more than what you would see at z equals zero, what you would see today. If you um, bump much more, then means you've got more mergings and more um, merger remnants. So it makes sense to want to, to look at those merger remnants particularly the merger remnants of very old things, because new things, they don't give very interesting. They've, they've been in, studied quite a lot and you see tails and bridges and things like that, but that's not the point now. So if I look at this literature, I found several um, papers in which they said that the Milky Way-like galaxies have had a major or intermediate size merger in the last eight to 12 giga years, about 50 to 100% of them. Now that's enough for me at least to be motivated to look at those remnants because if 50 to 100% got it, well, let's have a look at the 50, 100%. Um, so what I will do is I will take a very simple scenario of two proto galaxies initially without a disk, but forming their own little disk and orbiting somewhere 
uh, around each other somehow as initially at a very large distance and then they come nearer and nearer and they merge. That is what the problem I'm in going to look at. And since the, um, I would like to keep a door open for using those things to our own galaxy, then I will look at the major mergings occurred eight to 10 giga years ago. It's very easy to do other, other values as well, but I just thought that I might start with that. And um, then we, I will look, I will do the same thing as, as I did before, except that I would be going a few giga years back. And that will give me a proper bulge and some other good little goodies, which I will soon describe. There are also in the simulations that I'm going to show you some other um, nice parts, some other goodies. The one is, um, okay, that they're, they're simple dynamical and body simulations, but they include gas, star formation, feedback and cooling. That allows me to get within arrow bars, of course, the ages of stars and, and follow the gas flow. Then I will start, as I said, a bit before the actual merger. And I will include chemical evolution in order to be able to do chemodynamics. And so far I have 12 elements, but could easily add more. If anybody is interested in other elements, please contact me. I also have two types of, uh, of feedback out of which the most important is the AGN-like. And the, the simulations are very high resolution from 5 million to 30 million and the linear resolution, which is between 25 and 50 parsecs. When I say it, between 25 and 50 parsecs or between 5 million and 30 million, I don't mean they change during the simulation. I mean simply that some simulations have um, a, a linear resolution of 25 parsecs and others a linear resolution of 50 parsecs. And then the other thing is that I set off a rather um, hoping to get a lot of comparisons with real galaxies, with nearby, near, with nearby real galaxies, and then use the same techniques to look at the morphology of the, of the, of the simulation results and the morphology of the, uh, of the real galaxies. And, I will want to see that for the morphology, the kinematics, the photometry, the ages, the chemical, the chemical abundances, the metallicity, the metallicity gradient, blah, 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 blah. So all that's very nice, but I haven't done it all, of course. Ah, the most important thing that I have to do to tell you about is now, of course, we know that we always knew that gas, that gas is in, gal in disk galaxies. We knew that in that earlier times, there's more gas and nearby galaxies have less gas. But there is one thing which was very nicely um, found in last few years, and that is the circumgalactic medium. Nowadays, it is very much studied and so I got a simple model of this thing and put it on top of my disk and on top of my dark matter halo. So what I will be having is not only the dark matter halo plus the, the baryonic disk, but a hot gaseous halo. All that has the same centers. So now let me see why this hot gaseous disk is so important. I'm going to show you two simulations, which are more or less starting then more or less the same initial conditions, except for one thing. The one has a hot gaseous halo at the moment of the merging and the other one does not. And then the, with the simulation, which is called 223, you, saw the, you see the face on view on top and the edge on view in the bottom. And that does not have a gaseous halo. It has a dark matter halo to compensate so, uh, so that the thing is not it is in the same dynamical equilibrium, but there is no, it is not gaseous halo. Whereas the thing to the right is 
with a gaseous halo. That is, it, dynamically, they, these things are identical. What is different is whether the mass was given as a function of gas or the mass was given from the halo. Now, you will see that the one to the left is quite small. By the way, the little um, thing you see in the, in the back, sort of the grid you're seeing in the back, has little cells, and each cell is one kiloparsec per, for each rate, for each size. So you have one on X and one on Y, and each one is one kiloparsec. So you see that this thing would make a rather small galaxy. And it's no way you can make it any bigger, basically because of the angular momentum problems. And the um, edge on view is not really very realistic either. Now, if I go to the right one, it's very different. First of all, I can reach quite big sizes. This is one of the biggest sizes I, I made, but I have a very large number of such things with intermediate from about the same as to the left, but uh, and further up to, to the one of which is to the right. And here we have um, a rather big disk, as you can see, and it has nice morphology. That it is the morphology that we observe, that is bars. We can see it very nicely on the right-hand side, and we can see on the, on the left-hand side, we would see only uh, an oval kind, nearly circular, well, a little bit squashed um, oval. So that is not what bars look like. Whereas if I look at it at the right, it, it is what bars look like. Then they, I see spirals. There is no spiral at all in any of the simulations run as for the left side. Here, they're pretty reasonable, the, 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 the spirals. And particularly, the, there is quite a bit of a difference between the edge on views of the two cases. If I have the this left one, there is a continuity from the inner parts to the outer parts. If I look at this, it changes. The, the derivative would, would have a discontinuity. I can show you now a real galaxy and a real galaxy seen edge on, like the lower two pictures, the real galaxy is more or less independent. We see more of the things to the right, as far as I know, but I'm a theoretician, so you might want to correct me. There is more of these where you can see the bulge independently. For example, our galaxy, you can see the galaxy, the, the, the bulge independently. And this is without gaseous, the, and then in the one without the gaseous halo. So it looks like it's interesting. And I'm going to go now and do something different. I mean, it's a little bit like archeology, span but it's not really that. Um, I will take the, the simulation at its final moment, and then I will cut it as a function of age. That is, suppose you're observing this galaxy, then, and then you had glasses that could get you only the first giga year, um, the, the star, only the stars born in the first giga year. And then you had different glasses which gave you the stars from the end of the first to the third, et cetera, et cetera. So what would I see? Okay, this is rather easy to, to see. I have a sequence of five times, five birth times, of the stars, and I have now the the, um, the little squares again are there to show you how the one kiloparsec because the I've blown up the left side with so that you see better the in, the inner part. It would be by far too small compared to the right side. And the the first thing I will look at is the stars that were born in the proto galaxies, that is before the merging started. Those stars are, so those stars were born as far back as possible within my simulation. And the, um, they are, therefore they are the oldest stars in that galaxy. I'll be saying galaxy, it's in fact simulation all the time, but okay, I'll try and remember and say simulation. Anyway, the oldest of those star, the oldest of the stars are in the 
are the ones that were born earlier. So in the separate proto galaxies. And so this component has the oldest stars, is very gas poor. There is a classical bulge, if you analyze it properly, and it undergoes violent relaxation. What does that mean? Well, that's something brought by Donald Linden Bell. It's, uh, it's when there's a collapse of a spheroidal object, then the, the, there is a lot of motions and things go, I can't say quite chaotic, but maybe I should. And that is what would be witnessing here. This is the result. And indeed, I will show later. Oh, let me show it right away. Here you are with the density profiles of this thing. And this is a Cersic profile. And that is what you would expect from the, um, from the violent relaxation. And it, lo and behold, it is found. Now, the second pair of glasses I have is for the merging period. That is, I'm going to look to be able to see only the stars which were born during the merging period. Those have, they're not as old, they're still quite old, but they're not as old, of course, as the previous ones. So I will call them intermediate. They are gas poor. And what is very interesting, they don't only, they have a thick disk nowadays, and they also have a bar of the thick disk. Now, why does all that happen? Well, to a large extent, if I just want to say two words, is strong shuffling. And that's why you get, we get on all those things. Now, if you look at the bottom two panels, then you see that there are ellipsoidal features, but it's not really bars. It's just what one would expect for the thick disk bars. And if I look at it edge on, then I would see that this, uh, this is probably the best is the lowest uh, panel you have. And it's, it does have um, a boxy feature like we would expect the young ones to do, but also the intermediate ages one do. Then on the right side, I have stars which were born very lately and they, they have secular evolution, by that I mean slow evolution. And if I look at that population, it's gas rich, it evolves slowly, and it forms the thin disk, the bar, the spiral, the rings, and the disk pseudobulge. So it does a lot for you. You can see it in the bottom panels. The, uh, you can see the bar in, uh, in in the left one of the two bottom panels. And you can see that there is a small but clear um, X feature now, which means the bar is stronger. And yes, it is. If you look at the previous, what I showed you previously, there is difference. And so the, uh, it is expected, therefore, that the, uh, that, the, that the BPX feature is an X rather than a B. And uh, on the right, you see that the, uh, the very, very youngest stars are in the, in the arms, are forming in the arms. If I want to do photometry of those things, so I'm going to look at log density. I would have looked at log density if I was re doing real photometry, but I suppose everything is a nice to me and I can do densities instead of intensities. Well, the leftmost is the one which I showed you already, the one that has the Schlesig's law. And then as you go to the right, you have, for example, the second one from the left has two components. One is the bulge, which we discussed already, classical bulge. And then this one, the other one is a very nice exponential disk. This next one, again, same thing. You start seeing, if you look at it carefully, between 15 and 20 kpc, it starts like there is a, a little break. And indeed, if I look at the two last ones, I see the break quite clearly, somewhere between 15 and 20. And you can see uh, in all of those also, you can see the, the age brackets which these um, this plots show. Now in the right, there's many bumps. It's not because I lost my ruler. It is simply because there is all those very strong spiraled features. And those things will show you 
will give you this uh, bumpy features. Basically also, they are this ring-like thing. So you, even though you average azimuthally, you're still quite bumpy. Then in order to understand a little bit more, what I did was to take the population at, at the present moment and find for each star or particle actually, find what we call its circularity. That is a parameter which is a pain in the neck to calculate. But if you do it by miracle you manage, then it is quite interesting in the sense that it tells you how circular this particular a particle or star or whatever is. So now I will look at, first of all, the, st the, uh, the stars that were born, uh, let's say here, the, the, the blue, it is between zero and 1.4 giga years. And if I look at the plot, this royal blue, I would call it now, this royal blue is not quite symmetric, but it is nearly symmetric. And it would be like that if it was a simple spherical thing. Then the next step is the 1.4 to 1.8 giga years. And you can see the photometry right above you. It is the same uh, stops in, in time. Then the red one, is between 1.8 and 2.2 giga years. And you notice that it has the same form as the others, but very near one, it goes up. Now, one thing I forgot to tell you, not for any other reason, but just simply forgot. The, um, the one means that circularity, is, that is a, a circularity is one and therefore this thing is a circular, fully circular orbit. So if you are near one, you should have a disk. And when you're far from one, you should have something like a more spheroidal thing. And indeed the red population, which is the one that is between 1.8 and 2.2. So in the middle in your upper panels has into the right, what one could call a disk but it's a thick disk because I get quite a lot of not too circular orbits. And then the, the, the remaining part is, is like the others, like what we had before. Then the stars that were born between 2.2 and nine giga years, they are relatively young stars and you will see that they will get a lot of material into a disc-like thing. And indeed, this is the cyan curve. And you see that you could have a lot of stars in the disc there. And there is still something to the left of the picture. And then finally, between nine and 10 giga years, there's all the messes we saw before, but also all the beautiful spiral structure. And you see that that is really, really a disk, a thin disk. And that's why it is so very near all of it to a circularity equals one. I forgot to mention that circularity minus one is retrograde stars. And you must have guessed it because that's what, that's what made the blue thing. Uh, yes, I think I'll stop this. And I will look now at the properties of major merger remnants. And this is three simulations, all of them basically with the same mass ratios in the beginning, uh, but several dis differences in the trajectories of the two galaxies that bump into each other. In the upper panel, I just show the stars and it's all the stars. It is like this one, like the second from the left, but here it's not all the stars. It's only the stars that were born, remember, the, the born in, the, in a given age bracket. 
So back we go. So here's all the stars. And we have three pretty, pretty decent bars. I mean, it's very good bars. And if I look at the zoom, so that I make a, a blow up of this, uh, of this central parts, so you can see that they sometimes have ANSI. That there is the inner parts, which show clearly. And in the one at the left, there was also an inner ring, which particularly in the, in the um, lower part is quite clear. In the upper part, it was less clear. That is because those simulations are rather, well, violent, I could say, because the, um, a lot of bumps, I mean, when two things, when two galaxies bump into each other, they're not meant to just nicely sit down and, 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 and take that turn. They just bump and therefore this thing may be, some parts might get hot and not make the, the ring. And that's just, you can see it on the lower part. This is clearly an inner ring. Then I look at the edge on uh, view of the, of, the, of, of the same of these galaxies. And I see they are mainly uh, boxy things. And then the lowermost one is again, the, um, the, um, the face on view. And again, the grid in the back is for you to see the size. And if you look, and, it, and this thing now is the gas. So we see that the gas, the, the gaseous, um, um, the gaseous structure is quite similar. You can see clearly that is in this in those types of galaxies. And you are you see some thick, some also features which you see quite often, like for example this nearly 90 degrees turn that there is. And also in the middle one, I've seen now lately a lot and lots and lots of those um, galaxies. And well, they're pretty easy to form. So if anybody is interested, just give me a ring. Now, um, the next thing I was going to look at is the bar length. Since they are so nicely, uh, since they have such nice bars, let's now try and make some quantitative comparisons. So this is the results from the S4G work headed for this paper by Diaz Garcia et al. in 2015. And um, this, the dotted, um, the, the, the colored dots are, um, the colored dots are the individual cases, stars, sorry, individual galaxies for the S4G. And the black rectangles with the narrow bar show the actually average or average values of the bar. And on the left side, we have the, R, the, the bar radius and, as an, and, and on, the, on the bottom, galactic stellar mass. So we see that the, uh, the, the uh, ah, and then, okay, at the time when I was doing this comparison, I had only those three simulations. So if you look at the one but left um, case, you will see that there's a black filled circle when that is the, the average of the three galaxies which you have here. As time went on, I had more cases. I don't, didn't have time to plot them, but I have more cases. And yes, they do look, they all agree very nicely. There's a very good agreement between the S4G Diaz Garcia work and the simulations I just showed you. Okay, so much for that one. The next one. Oh, no, I'm going to go back. Okay, now the um, I, I showed in in one case the uh, the density log density as a function of radius, and observations have shown for quite some time ago. I mean, it's uh, you can find some of the observations here. Um, than the uh, listed here, but there are more. I just didn't have the possibility of putting them all down. And uh, then, the, so what they look like is they, they, there is first a part in the most part, which is the bulge, which is not interesting to us right now. 
And then there is the exponential part. And the observers, and particularly Peter Irwin, um, classified this, yeah, this uh, profiles into three different types. Type one has no break or practically no break. We say no break because, well, I mean, we don't know really, but practically no break in the sense that if you work incredibly carefully, you see a beginning of a break. Then there is a second one with a down bend, which we call down bending profile because the bending is towards the bottom. And again, there is, um, there is a, a break. And then there is type three, which is um, upbending and it's an anti-truncation. Uh, so the least frequent type is the one to the left and the most frequent type is the one in the middle. So it was interesting for me to have a look at whether I found something which was reasonable in my simulation. And that was, you can see in the lower row. And simulations of this type were made by other people before me. I already, I have put them down and this uh, Roscar particularly had done some beautiful work. And um, the, uh, what, is, what we see is that there are some very similar things. That is, the, there is some um, galaxies which have no break. Although you can start seeing in the outer part something that is it's an outer break perhaps, but it is not quite clear because at that point you start having also, you start also going out of the plane. So it's not as easy to, to get things straight. Then the, the, inter, the, average, the intermediate one have truncations. There were down bending truncations. Here's a good example from my simulations. There they got in the middle roughly the, uh, this down bending. And then the last one, which is an up bending, I also get. So it is rather interesting to note that first, there are no other morphologies except for that. Now you'll tell me, how do you do anything except for three uh, possibilities? It's either straight or it's up or down. Yes, but there could be more than two. There could be more than one like that, and more than two if you get the outer break. So there could be anything you want, and there aren't. They do just what you wanted, qualitatively. Then quantitatively, they're in the right ballparks. And so one could say that, you know, that, that the, at least as far as we can go, the, that we find the three types of breaks and they're region, reasonable, and therefore one could, one could say one could be happy about it. Now, there is also some more um, things when we could be checking this plot. Um, and that is that the break is not, it is not dependent on the color or therefore on the population. All populations are having the same position for the break. So this is some work, observational work by Radburn Smith. And you can see that he had three different types. So he read blue and I don't remember what the middle one is. And they have a break. And if you put a vertical line, you see that the three are at exactly the same position for the break. Same thing from some work of Munoz Mateos. I don't know if it ever got published this on 5985, but I mean, he's given me some copies. And you can see again that this, this actually was molecular gas and, and um, millimeter um, three, and, and the photometry is at 3.6 microns. And then you also see there that the gas and the and the stars, the old the, the old stars have the same break, which is very interesting in the sense that we go one part, step further than what Radburn Smith did in introducing also the um, the gas. And now what do I do? I plot on the break radius for stars on the x axis and the break radius for gas on the y axis. And I 
um, and every one of my simulations is a filled circle and there is uh, error bars and you will see that the match is pretty good. That is, the, my simulations also show that the break radius for the stars and for the gas is the same as did the observations. Right, so that's another little thing gained. The next point is about the thin and the thick disk. Uh, yes, let's do this one. Well, this the existence of the thick disk, I think, was first shown by Gilmore and Reed. Actually, no, there were even some older work, but let's start with this since, since I have the plot here. And there is two parts here. One part, and this is as a fun, this is the log space density as log distance. Uh, sorry, as distance, as a function of distance. And you find that the, the stars that were high up have the higher densities. And here we have a second part. So I did this in a number of my simulations, not all of them, but a, quite a neat number. And I did as a function of Z, Z now is Z, um, X, Y, Z. So in kiloparsecs, and I plot the function of Z, the density, in some arbitrary units after having cut the, the stars in my simulation. So in the, um, the, um, the particles in my simulation, so, so that at the, at the, at whether they're the birth, they've got, the birth is higher after the merging or before the merging. So did the star burn, born get born before the merging, or did it get born after the merging? So this makes you two categories. And for each one, I was plotting the, um, the density as a function of Z. And you find, and you see that they stop, they, they, they cut each other a little bit before 2KPC. And I call that Z cut. So the, you see in red, the complete, the complete um, density. The black is the stars that were born before the, uh, they were born uh, before the, sorry, their birth time is after the merging. And the uh, blue is the birth time is before the merging. So immediately you can see if the birth time was before the merging, the Z values can go very high, which the other, the, the black ones didn't, they couldn't. So you have things as far as, as five kiloparsecs, but only if in the blue one, which the birth was before the merging. Uh, then I, same thing here. Now I want to do in, um, in another way, I want to see the whole thing in another way. Instead of cutting with the birth, I will cut with Z, uh, with ZC. So those that the Z is less than ZC and those that the Z was higher than ZC. And that is the brownish, yellow brownish line. I have this, and you see that those were necessary. The T birth was large. So it was relatively recently that this was born. I also have put a vertical line, which is the merging time. And then the yellow parts go also in the other side. And they have a classic, and that part we see would be a classical bulge and a thick, and a thick disc or bulge, or bar, sorry. So, This is the kind of things, observations one would get. And you find that the merging time is a very good way of dividing the galaxies, the, 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 the stars in the galaxy into disks 
and classical bulge and thick components. So, um, the thick disk is composed mainly of stars born before or during the merging period. So the thick disk forms earlier and in a shorter time scale than the thin disk. Now that's interesting, the, particularly the shorter time scale is interesting, but because a number of, uh, of, um, um, of, of models with chemical evolution and chemical for, and chemodynamical models have a, require a shorter time scale. And here you would get it for free. Um, the thick disk is near ubiquitous. That is not my result, but it, it is certainly in my results. The difference between the thin and the thick disk come in naturally. That is merger dynamics versus secular dynamics. The thick disk rotates slower and has gas higher and has higher velocity dispersion, which is what we were expecting, what we would like it to have. Otherwise, the whole thing would be for the dust dustbin. The thick disk has different substructures or substructures with different properties, which is afterwards. I, I don't know whether I will have some time, but the um, for example, the bar properties are different for the thick disk and for the thin disk. Uh, in some cases, you can't get any spiral structure. Um, as, would want, as we would have wanted it. The thicker the bar, the less answers you get. The thin disk population is older than the thin disk one, which is what I showed you in the previous year. And they have very different metallicities and alpha element abundances. I have, have done comparisons with observations. They go quite nicely. And that is it for that one. And now let's go a little bit into bars in thin and, di thin and thick disks. Okay, now this is very old simulations. They are back from 1983. And at that time I was visiting Cambridge and I was quote unquote allowed to have some CPU time. And I saw that with what I was allotted, the um, I could run five simulations if I used Jerry Selwood's code. And I started looking at what the possibilities I would get. So I, what I wanted to look at is the colder and the, the this and the colder and versus hotter disk. So I have QT, there's many other properties, but they're more or less the same. On the other hand, what changes is the velocity dispersion. So QT, the colder disk and QT, hotter disk. It, it spans a whole uh, value. So it goes from one for the, the bare stability to hotter disks with two. And then I let the whole thing run. And lo and behold, the bar came up and the major axis of the bar is A in this thing. And the minor axis is B. And if I plot one minus B over A, the thinner bar is the colder disk and the thicker bar is the hotter disk, which is just what we would have wanted. Okay, it's old simulations, they have been uh, they have been uh, run, they don't have gas, they also have some other simplifications, I mean the 2D for example, and so on and so forth. And then I had one simulation still left over, as I told you, there was had five, and I start with two populations of equal mass. 
one cold and one hot. And the bars did form both in the colder and the hotter disk. And they have the same pattern speed, which one should ex would have expected because if they didn't, they would be pulling each other, but they have different morphologies. And there is some work, very nice work, particularly by Francesca Frangudi on the subject a bit more recent, well, quite some recent and better in, therefore in, in, in technically. So here is this and I use now this is was is an easy thing to do if you don't if you're not too ambitious for some obscure reason I wanted to put bar particles only I didn't put any disk particle in this thing now how do you manage to disentangle the thing well very easily well very easily it's very it's a point pain in the neck but it's straightforward you look at the orbits so every single one of my orbits I looked at and I used both the density and the kinematics and I divided by age of stars. On the left, so the upper, um, the upper line, the upper row is for, is for uh, face on and the lower one is edge on. The upper line had all stars to the left and the thick disc stars are the second from the left and the thin disc stars the third one from the left. And so if I look at that, I see immediately that the this the 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 um, the, the stars which were in the thick disk are also in a thick bar, and the stars which were in the thin disk, they also have a thin bar. Okay, so much for that. Well if I wanted to see how well or how badly this um, theory with these models with um, mergings are, I have to make some comparisons. And in many things, they did surprisingly well, better than I hoped. For example, they have bars and the bars are well, have the same morphology as real bars. They have the NC, for example, they have BBX structures. They have uh, disky pseudobulges. They have which are as thin as you like them. They have rings, spirals, etc., with correct morphology. So that's a lot. They have the three types of bulges that can coexist. That's the classical, the disky, and disky bulges, and well, the two, sorry, types. And then, oh, sorry, yes, with the BPX, I put them like that. So it's classical, disky pseudo bulges, and BPX. And uh, then, um, the minimum mass ratio of classical bulge to total mass is 10 to 20%. I can't go lower, and that is an inset um, thing for um, inset by the way the whole thing has been done. And that is because the, the, the bulge is made by, if you remember, I had cut the um, the oldest stars would be making the classical bulge. So they have to be oldest stars. Therefore, that has to be a considerable amount of classical bulge. Well, it's not terribly much, and it's certainly better than most cosmological simulations and by a good factor. But anyway, I couldn't make it zero, even if I tried very hard. The surface density radial profiles are correct and in agreement. And they have uh, disk surface densities like one, two, and three. The, there's a, a break, an outer break, and a, a, a break radius. Uh, that, uh, how does it go evolution with time? Yeah, I don't have the time to go into it. Uh, the thin, thick disk properties are in good agreement with observation. Kinematics, although it's in product progress, looks pretty good. The rotation curves are pretty good. You've got an example to the right. The best part is the chemical abundances, which is still in progress because I'm not much of a chemical person, so I'm doing my best. And so far, 
so good and most of that tests are in, in progress. And then I thought, well, since I was at it and since everybody now works on the, on the Milky Way, let's try it. And now I did a cut. So remember, so far I've cut things like with age, I cut things with, with all sorts of whatever you want, I've cut. Um, and here I will do another one which, for which I need chemistry. It, it, so this is a, a chemical work, which is in collaboration with Sergei Rodionov and Nikos Pranzos. And I cut, or we cut, by metallicity. So here we have an FE over H between minus 1 and minus 0 0.5, minus 0 0.5 and 0, 0 and 0 0.5, and 0 0.5 and 1. And you will notice immediately that these fellows and these, well, these fellows more or less are all in an X shape. If you look at it a bit, then you see even the X shape. And the, uh, the, the one on the upper right, you still also see the, the X shape, but you also see the, um, an, an ellipsoidal shape. And in the, bracket between minus one and minus 0 0.5, you have more or less only this spheroidal shape. And this is what exactly has been observed by Melissa Ness and some collaborators. And the interesting thing to remember here is that for any point you, you wish to take, the chances are that you will find something which has more than one type of stars. So in the central areas, because this is the central areas, the part where the X shape is, the disc is, you can see the disc in the upper two lines on the right, outmost right and outmost left, but that's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about the bulge and that bulge thing if I integrated along the line of side, I would get all sorts of different stuff and stuff with all sorts of different dynamics, particularly the latter. You would get stuff where the, the kinematics are that of the spheroid and another lot with the kinematics would be in the X and another lot which would be not very far from a bo boxy peanut thing. So it is, to be expected in any observations that if you integrate along the line of sight, and most of the time you do because it's very difficult to untangle them, particularly near the bar. Well, if you do that, then you are bound to have collected a lot of very different stars. Um, now, there is some more work by Melissa Ness Ken Freeman, myself, and many others, with the Argos um, sample. And here you will notice that, ah, and here I would plot the velocity dispersion of the stars, of the stars as a function of galactic longitude. The upper panels, the upper three panels are the observations. The lower three panels are the simulations. So in the upper panels, we have two sets. Let's forget the intermediates. They're always, they always are in between. So fine, let's forget about them. In the left part where you have Fe over H, which is large, so it's metal rich. So it's young stars here. Then you find that a clear structure. In red, we have whatever is near the galactic plane. In blue is what is far from it. And of course, everything else in between. So we see, if we compare the two, then we see that there is a very good agreement in the sense, and particular in the sense, that we're not modeling specifically our galaxy. I don't have a model which I don't know anybody else actually has a model of our own galaxy fully for everything. And therefore, it is not possible to say we should have found 
for example, this little B B here thing. No, there's no need to because it's a different it's a different um, galaxy. But it the qualitatively uh, um, agreement is really very very good, and we find that you know the um, sigma well it has a peak at a zero longitude which we were expecting, uh, but it has a definite rise in the center, whereas the blue is quite flat. And that's exactly what we find here and would be expected from many, for, for many galaxies. And if I look at the metal pores um, um, stars, those are the old stars. Therefore, all the stars in that category should have higher velocity dispersion. And yes, this is exactly what you see. You have the, all those are just uh, the maximum of the plot possible. You know, you just go as high as they, they go as high as possible. And then here, they are, they are much less so because, you know, for example, this one is quite low and, and even that one has only one part, which is around 120, whereas the other ones is, uh, is much lower. So we find a qualitatively very good agreement and even quantitatively, the, the worst that happens is 30%. And I think this would be all. And uh, sorry if I was over my time. Thank you. Thank you very much, Leah, for the very nice talk. Uh, there is time for some questions. Let me check in there. Here, if there is someone to, to ask first. Yes, please, Preben, here is the. Thank you for a nice talk. Um, you didn't mention if the break rate are associated to stellar resonances. Yes, thank you for the very difficult question. It's not trivial. It's not trivial. Surely, um, where am I now? Yes, oh no, we'll get to this one, but it's nearly there. I did have one here, for example. Yes, uh, there is good hope that this would be the middle one. The would be the um, that one of them now would be at least one of them would be the corrotation. I haven't worked harder on it. I've just looked at some points, was happy with myself, and went further. I don't think I would like to comment too much about it. Okay, so there are two questions uh, from the audience here, and then we come to Peter and Dimitri. Hi, Leah. It's Thank you for this talk. Just to add a bit to this last remark uh, about the inner break, could that be related to the inner limb land resonance? I mean, what? Oh, mean to no, 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 it's by far too out. The inner break, this, oh, you mean the break which divides with the bulge with the, um, sorry, there are three vertical lines in my plot. I don't know whether you see it. There are three vertical yeah. lines, the innermost line, the dotted line and the outer line. So the outer break is the outer one, and this one is the, uh, the, the middle break. Which one are you asking about? The yeah, other look, one? If you look the last three, the last, let's say, row, the second row below, yes. uh, at the beginning, you have essentially a smooth transition from the, let's say, exponential disk, essentially to the... Yes. To, to sort of speaking, but as you move on, you see that there is a break formed there as well. So I would say exactly that one. So I would say that probably, probably I have no, no idea if that can, can be justified in some way, but just taking into account the fact that the inner limb land resonance is a, generally speaking a source of heat for the system. So it tends 
to equalize the things they look, just... look, look uh, before, I mean, look at this number. It's 5 kpc. Now, an ILR at 5 kpc would have a bar about um, 25 parsec, kiloparsecs. Well, depends on the value of the pattern speed. Depends on the value of the pattern speed? Why? I mean, I, I, what I'm telling you is that the inner limb blood resonance had, if the inner limb blood resonance is at five, then the uh, corrotation is at the other end. That's, that's no problem. But the five is by far too big. I haven't seen many galaxies, so maybe Peter would know that better, or in, and um, Dimitri. Um, did you see galaxies with inner limb blood resonance at five? If you think of a nuclear ring as approximately an inner limb blood resonance, then no, the largest ones are about one kiloparsec. Yes, exactly, exactly. And I, I would say that that from this profile, that that sort of transition at five kiloparsecs is the transition between probably the transition between the disk outside the bar and just the bar itself. That it, is, yes, plus the bulge. Yes, exactly. So that is the thing. I can't put in a Lindblad there. It's, it's really a funny galaxy. Perhaps theoretically you can. I mean, I'm not saying you can't, but um, in, in practice, I mean, in real galaxies, I, I've never seen it. And if the two specialists here haven't seen it either, well, I feel safe. Okay, thank you. Okay. Three questions more. Here is one from Kanak. Oh. And then come to Hello? Hello? Hi. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Yeah. So I had a question on the on your setup in the in the first case when you had two show two simulations with uh, without hot gaseous yellow and with the uh, gaseous yellow. Um so can you tell us what happens to the hot gaseous yellow? Does it cool down over time and what kind of time scale? And what is the process of cooling here? Is it the radiative cooling being included? Yes, radiative cooling has been put in. Uh, the, um, the idea is the following, that the, this thing, we start with something which is dark matter and hot gas, period. Now the hot gas, um, loses it starts going towards the uh, the plane of the of the of the disk or rather let's say to perpendicular of the angular momentum because the the halo always has a little bit of angular momentum and so then you fall it falls in and um, as it does that it moves also so that is an, another kind of migration. Um, which I'm also looking at, but I mean, it, it, it's, not, it's not trivial. So the idea is that the stuff comes um, to, the, to the plane and then moves either inwards or outwards, but doesn't stay put. Um, what, what, was, what else did you want, sorry? Then the, the, when the, um, I mean, the, this extent of this thing is enormous. Of the of the of the gaseous halo, like the dark matter halo, they're both or they, whatever is is, is is there is quite extended. It's not as I mean the the baryonic part is much more concentrated than those. So the baryonic stars, sorry, I mean, fell apart. Uh, the the gas when it falls into the disk loses some of its hot of its temperature on the way and at the moment it gets there and then has and then will either form a star right away or move and get a star there or whatever there is a lot practically all possibilities and it does so i was trying to really point out in the next slide you show that the, the spiral structure seemed to form around nine to ten giga year uh, sorry um uh, you wanted which this one? The, the spiral structure you showed in in a time sequence. It seems to form around nine to ten giga year, which is a yes. very long time. Yes, it's it's 
sorry, the, the, I don't know what you're seeing right now. I am seeing um, five panels uh, with um, the ring, like in the outer parts, and then the spiral structure further in. Um, now, I don't know how to... Um, I'm afraid I can't move anymore because... Oh, well, never mind. But I mean, the last of the five panels is um, is in about one gig a year, yes. Born in yes. the stars, the stars itself. I'm not talking about the spiral, I'm talking about the stars. And they form also there. Then you What's have that? other kind of stars and other kind of, um, of spirals, which are the, a little bit further in, in, in the plot. And uh, you can see it is, um, there is a, a, a they, they come from roughly the end of the bar. Mm -hmm. No, the, the outer spiral structure, my question was actually very straight in this, that the cooling of the gaseous halo was related to the, to the cooling time scale was related to the to the outer spiral structure that you see, because the cooling is probably slow. Uh, could, the be. could be, could be. I'm nothing against it. Could well be. I'll, I'll check it if you want me to. I'll, I, it's interesting, actually. Your, your comment is very interesting, actually. I'm, I'll be happy to. Uh, to Thank you. It. Okay, then Peter, please go ahead. Ask your okay. question. Um, so just a, a quick comment to the earlier question about resonances and breaks and disc profiles mm. in the type two profiles. Um, we made an argument in Urban and all 2008, and there's more argue, evidence for this in Munoz, Monteus et al. 2013, that there may be two types of type two breaks. In early type barred galaxies, it looks like it's often associated with the outer Lindblad resonance of the bar. But in later type spirals, and particularly unbarred spirals, where type 2 profiles are very common, it's probably something else, such as a, a break in the uh, a star formation threshold. So my question for Leah is, um, and this, this is the slide I wanted to ask about, so this is great. Um, on the left hand, you've got what you're calling the classical bulge. And I look at that, and I see in the face-on view that it's actually quite oval, and yes. it's aligned with the bar. Yes. So how is that actually a classic? Why is that a classical bulge? I am looking at the galaxy today. And today mm -hmm. there is a bar. Mm -hmm. So, you know, the, the bar makes it a little bit, well, a little bit, quite a bit of a, of a squash. Now, this is very small, so I can't say much. I can't say it's a bar. It's, it is a bulge because look, look at the size of the one kiloparsec line. Um, I mean, the grid, sorry. And you have a grid and the, the one kiloparsec thing. I mean, the- uh, Oh, okay. I, I hadn't seen that you were changing the grid size. Okay. Yes, yes. That's why I'm putting those little things because otherwise, you know, if you think that this thing is the same <laughs> as the other one in the end, then I'd really be in trouble. Okay, it's it's still curious that it's aligned with the bar. And I'm I'm wondering whether, you know, as an observer, would I be able to see this in a, in a present day galaxy and say, oh yes, there's a classical bulge. Or, or would I not oh, be able to recognize it? I don't know. I don't know. It's, uh, I, I don't know. You would be able to see the, um, the, the, the uh, density as a function of radius and you would say this is a, class this is a classical bulge. Well, but I, but 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 then again, I might I might say, well, that's I, you know, I might have trouble distinguishing the density from that of the the boxy peanut bulge, for instance. 
yeah, 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 yeah. Well, I'm, I'm sorry. The, the world is very difficult for you. You know? <laughs> put all of things in the middle and don't, don't allow, doesn't allow you to do it properly. I'm terribly sorry. But I can help because I can perhaps give you just certain pieces. And then you would be able to see how it goes with the center. If you tell me more information, more, more stuff, I'd be very happy to do it. Okay, I'll, 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 I'll see if I can come up with something. Um, I'll okay. turn it over to, to Dimitri now. Okay. Thank you, um, Dimitri. Uh, first of all, thanks, Leah, for the very nice talk. Uh, I have two questions, actually. So I'll start with the first one, which is related to what Kanak was saying. Um, I was also thinking that I, I wonder if you have to uh, constrain the time scale for the cooling of the gas from the hot halo mm -hmm. so that you avoid the gas um, to interfere with the formation of the bar, right? Because if you have too much gas, you, you might interfere with the formation of the bar. I wonder if you can elaborate a little bit on this. Well, I haven't really looked at very different values of this uh, of this cooling basically because the one that i was really interested in is how the cooling sets when you are not when you're up there when the, the particle is up there in the, in, 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 in the halo but as it comes nearer well first of all it loses some of its energy all along all along all along until it hits the disc and there he, it may actually either stop there with high chances of making a star or oscillate around the disk. And uh, why is it oscillates? It loses more of its energy. Mm. And then it settles in the disk and, and uh, well, lives happily ever after. Okay. Um, so my, my second question is about the, the disk pseudo bulges, right? I, I was wondering, you already showed a lot of, uh, in a lot of ways, how the simulations um, matched the observations, but, you know, we observers can always ask for more. So I was wondering, <laughs> I was wondering if you had looked at the properties of the disk pseudo bulges you form. Um, so for example, the, the, the ratio of the nuclear disk we call this nuclear disk, right? Um, the, the ratio of the nuclear disk to the size, to the to the bar size, if, if you can match the observations, because I have seen oh. some simulations from um, from other groups where, where they have trouble matching this, this ratio. I haven't tried at all. But from what you tell me, it sounds a very interesting thing to try. And... Uh... Yes, I think so. It's size mainly, and you also want mass or uh, rapid mass, rate of sizes. Ma uh, I think the most interesting things really would be the size of the nuclear disk compared to the size of the bar, and the and compared to the ellipticity of the bar also. Yes. If if I could comment, I, I mass is probably easier to measure. It more is is less unambiguous just because it's hard to define the the yes, size i was hoping that he would say yes that's what i want that's why I, but, but no the difficult ones well i would like both yeah. of them you want both okay <laughs> the radius of a disk is 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 tricky to define mm -hmm. sure but as long as you're defining in, in systematically the same way you should be able to compare them so yeah. I, I i mentioned the sizes because i see other simulations not reproducing this and, and so i find that that is, that is interesting constraint to, to yes try to wouldn't we be expecting a little bit like this uh, five criterion which is a you know a really a very very rough thing between this uh, nuclear disk and um, and the end of the bar roughly a factor five um we we see um, from the top of my head now, I think it's a factor, uh, actually more, it's a factor of 10. 10? Yeah. It's a factor of 10 for the inner bars to outer bars of double barred galaxies, if, if that's of, of any use. Okay, yes, yeah. yes, so then it should be 10, you're right. Okay, that I have to note down. 
So you expect something around 10 from the observations. Okay. Mm -hmm. Or right. between five and 10, let's say. That's a bit yeah, that If you wanted a, exactly at 10, I wouldn't, I don't think I would make it, but I mean, look at it. Uh, uh, no, it doesn't have it here. No, no, I don't have it. Well, we, we can be in touch and, and... Yes, please. Yes. I point this one to clarify it, certainly. Well, uh, I don't see anybody else who wants to ask something. We are already, we have to move a little bit. So let's uh, thank Leah again. Uh, we move on to the next talk by Christos. Uh, we have already stopped. Okay, so thank you, thank you very much. Your screen, okay, full screen. Work, okay, nice. Thank you, Panos, uh, very much also for this opportunity to uh, come back to this kind, let's say, of studies, I would like to speak today about manifolds under, mani under multiple pattern speeds. But before that, uh, I would probably start by making some very general observation, which is essentially the fact that the manifold theory, when we speak about manifold spirals, is no longer a new theory. We have already passed more than 15 years since the first uh, works that as was summarized by Professor Kontopoulos this morning were done essentially in parallel by two groups, one around Lea Thanasula in Marseille and the other in Athens, the first with Voglis and later with many of us in the academy actually. Um, and uh, so I would call it a time for checkout or maybe a time for figuring out what have we learned? I mean, we, it's probably a good moment to figure out do we, what do we get out of that theory? I mean, do we reach to understand some features and what are the open problems? What, what is it that we don't get to understand out of, let's say, the basic model based on manifolds? Well, we know there are some basic things that have already been discussed. I mean. The theory applies anyway to galaxies with a strong non axisymmetric perturbation, and typically barred galaxies. Uh, but these barred galaxies are quite far from what the, at least the original models 
were implying. So you, you, you don't have one pattern speed and you don't have any constant pattern speed over time. And even the shape of the bar could change and the kinematic content, let's say, of the disk could evolve in time. And all of this could happen in reality. Uh, so we we need certainly to to take this into account if manifold theories to to have any meaning in the end. And uh, another thing is that, uh, well, so far we've done a lot of work in models and body simulations and so on, but there is less work about the comparison with real morphologies. So there is this is still an open issue. We'll come back to that, and also the relation to kinematic laws, let's say the velocities in the, in the disk. And this is something that has been emphasized already. Actually, we will come to that by the works mostly of Panos, Patsis. And uh, probably this is another area where observations are needed somehow to, to see whether the manifold paradigm can lead to any meaningful conclusion. Okay, so this gives you a bit the many of the things that I would like to discuss, except for the technical, purely technical aspect, which is the creation of the manifold model in the multiple pattern speed case itself. So, okay, let's go a bit back to the beginning of the story, which actually probably starts even earlier than Kaufman and Kontopoulos with the work of Spark and Selwood that was mentioned this morning. And this particular population of stars that were early identified in both dynamical studies and and body simulations that were christened hot population by these people. So essentially it means, let's say, point masses that move in the galactic potential. This is a BART potential and they have the property that they can move in and out of correlation. So you essentially get uh, get these orbits, these are chaotic orbits that were found by Kaufman and Kontopoulos. And what they do is that as long as they are inside the corotation, they support the outer parts of the bar. And as long as they go outside corotation, they tend to support at least the initial parts of uh, spiral arms. And that gives a possibility to have a different way of understanding, let's say, these structures than the classical density wave theory where you have this, this sketch essentially drawn first by Carl Nice, which is the idea of the precessing ellipses, the periodic orbits that concert their, their upsides in such a way as to support the wave. So here you have a completely different picture. Now, the, the, the term chaotic spirals, I mean, as such, uh, to, to my knowledge, was used mostly by Panos Patsis in a paper around the same epoch, actually, 2006, it all came together, to refer to the same type of orbits, but viewed now, I mean, the, the main feature, as I understand it, uh, is the velocities. I mean, so you, what you have here, I mean, the difference between this paradigm of the classical density wave and the one based on, on chaotic trajectories is the fact that when you have chaotic trajectories, these trajectories tend to give velocities that are aligned with the spiral. While in the classical density wave, the trajectories intersect essentially the spiral, probably about half the way between pericenter and apocenter. So there is a transversality in the flow. Maybe it's not evident from the figure, but if you check carefully, you will see that all these trajectories intersect the spirals, while for the chaotic ones, they seem to be just aligned. So, and this gives a kind, one could say, of even observational criteria and principles. So you, you don't need to know anything about chaos or order, but just be able to specify in some way. That's not very easy because you need to specify the velocities in a rotating frame. So these are the residual velocities after you subtract, let's say, the rotation of the bar itself. And of course, for that to be able to do, you need to know the pattern speed of the bar, which can be specified up to certain accuracy, but still, we don't know how well. Anyway, this is more or less marks the beginning of the story. And then, as we will see, uh, the, 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 
the picture with chaotic orbits, I mean, again, probably without any reference as yet to manifolds, just goes by the idea that these structures in phase space, we will explain what these things are, are essentially a coalescence of manifolds of many periodic orbits. You don't just need the Lagrangian points. And this is one of the things that uh, we try to emphasize with uh, Tsutsis several years ago in his PhD, that essentially what we do when we draw the manifolds emanating from L1, L2, and so on, the basic theory is just to give a sketch of the basic direction of the chaotic flow. But there is nothing in particular, uh, let's say nothing special about the manifolds of those orbits of L1 or the Lyapunov orbits around L1 and so on. I mean, you could, you could probably just put together the structure formed in phase space by joining the manifolds of many different families of orbits. And this gives you a clear picture of how you can get an organized essentially pattern out of motions which are typically chaotic. Okay, so let me now go though to define what we speak about because we say manifolds and so on, but probably we are in need of, a, of some definition here. So let's take a simplest, the simplest case, which is a bar model with a unique pattern speed. Well, in such a way that at the end of the bar, uh, at about the corotation radius, you have the unstable Lagrangian points L1 and L2, where essentially a star just corotates, remaining always aligned with the bar's major axis. And that means that when you regard it at the rotating frame of reference, you just don't see any motion at all. So it becomes an equilibrium point. And the stability character of this point just follows from trivial linear analysis of the eigenvalues as we will have done for any case of an equilibrium given the equations of motion. Okay, now if you move around this equilibrium, you have further orbits that are quite special. I mean, like, like these little circles, which you can see here. And these correspond to what we call the Lyapunov family of periodic orbits. You can have Lyapunov orbits horizontal, you can also have Lyapunov families vertical. I mean, what you see here is the horizontal case, but that's not the only one. I mean, you can, you can have also other cases. What do they essentially mean? I mean, just to give again a physical insight, you can assume an orbit which is no longer circular. It has an epicyclic oscillation by the usual epicyclic frequency, say. So there is nothing special on that. And its azimuthal frequency, let's say the angular velocity, still goes uh, with the same rate as for the orbits in corotation. So eventually when you regard that orbit in the rotating frame, all you see is the epicyclic oscillation itself. Okay, so that's, that's the definition of the orbit. And so now this naturally leads to what is the definition of the invariant manifolds of that orbit. I mean, here I give definition of the unstable manifold. It means figure out all possible initial conditions in position and velocity in the disk plane that lead to orbits who have a following particular property. Wherever those orbits start, if you integrate them backward in time, they will tend eventually to converge, all of them, very close to these epicyclic motions. And it's a very strange thing at the beginning. You might say, is there any initial condition at all that does that? I mean, you need to start figuring out everywhere in the disk, any initial condition and any velocity, that if you take that initial condition, you integrate the orbit backwards, the orbit will just go asymptotically to come closer and closer to the epicyclic Lyapunov orbit. So, of course, what interests us is the forward in time motion, which essentially means that the orbits in the forward sense do the opposite. So they start here and they unfold, essentially. So let us just give an, give an example. This is from, from a paper by Ilya Fanasula 
uh, well, here you see the Lyapunov orbit is this blue one. And then the orbits, some orbits, the red ones, which do precisely what I say, you can see them here. So you can, you have, let's say those initial conditions. If you try to integrate them backward in time, they would just do all the kind of oscillations, which they do up to the point that they arrive very close to the unstable orbit. And they, then from that point on, they essentially follow this empty cycle and not do nothing else. And in the forward sense of time, they just do the opposite. They just start from the epicycle. They probably make a couple of rounds here and then they go away. So they form essentially an ejectum of orbits from the region of those points L1. Now, this is a continuous in time, let's say, plot. So you just draw the trajectories integrated numerically. It's called the flux tube manifold, again, by the same group. And essentially, this terminology is not, let's say, was not new in galactic dynamics. It comes from the corresponding definition of flux tube manifolds in the restricted problem of free body. So it is, it's a known concept, uh, very known in, in celestial mechanics since decades. Okay, so you have a situation. Of course, the interest for us is what do they do? after they go away because at the beginning you can just this is just a matter of checking the eigenvalues to figure out at the beginning they just uh, move forward move away from the Lagrangian point in a trailing direction so you can say this is okay but then when you follow what they do for longer times you can get a variety of morphologies I mean you can get rings you can get pseudo rings you can get deformed spirals you can get open spirals you can get many different morphologies and this subject has been investigated by the same group quite quite extensively another issue here when this is essentially where enters a bit the Athens group uh, is related precisely to keep plotting that flow for quite longer times. So just to give, a, to give an idea, here you see the first phase. This is again from, from a simulation by Lee Thanasula. You see essentially what happens is that uh, trajectories that you start from, in, from the inner part of the bar will just be attracted by the stable manifolds. The stable manifolds do precisely the same thing as the unstable ones, but in the forward sense of time. So they will just and tend to be close to L2 in this particular case. And from there on, they move along those tubes. And this you can see very clearly happening, for example, in this simulation. But then you can say, what will happen if I keep drawing those, let's say, those trajectories for longer times? And here you have an example again, it's, it's the flux tube for short time and then the flux tube for longer times. And when you draw it for a longer time, the first impression that it is, is it doesn't make any sense. I mean, you don't, you don't get really something. And uh, well, but you have to take into account in this calculation that what matters really is not let's say the geometric trajectories, but where the density is. So let's say these trajectories are not covered uniformly in time. So you have, they spend most of their time in the upsides, upper centers and pericenters. And so it's not very democratic to show this plot as if all the points were equal for as much as density is concerned. And there is another thing here, which is related to the fact that if you, if you check carefully, you can, Notice that when you are close, for example, to the upper centers, you form a kind of caustic, you form a kind of density enhancement. So you need to somehow visualize that. And this is exactly what you can see here. So if you, you just take the same trajectories, actually calculated for way longer time. I mean, this plot is probably about 10 times as much as this plot, so that the plot, this plot becomes really ugly very fuzzy and if you just plot all the trajectory you don't see anything at all but if you just pick up all the upper centers of these trajectories just every point in though in any one of these trajectories where the orbit has reached its upper center okay you just put all these upper centers plot together and then you get something that is quite nice so just it just clears up 
And now you can see that if you just draw those places where the density is, you figure out that you can have uh, several features which are not very easy to see in the flux tube because then you would need essentially to do the same business, but having point around. So it's not a different plot, but it's, it better visualizes the situation. Essentially, what you see here is that uh, the manifolds at the beginning just, just do what the flux tubes say, but then they return, probably those, those that go from L1 can return to the neighborhood of L2. So then they can make several oscillations and create the kind of messy pseudo rings or whatever. I mean, you want to call these structures. So you get structures that are way more complicated and have probably some oscillations around and so on and so forth. Now, one of the basic properties, and I will return to this figure that I was saying a couple of transparencies before, uh, is that one, this comes from dynamics. So let's say if you, if you compute the manifolds, in the way that we gave the definition before. And then you take another periodic orbit who's, that also has manifolds, which would be the ones tending now asymptotically to that periodic orbit that wouldn't be the Lyapunov one. So you can do that. Here we have from nine different families of periodic orbits in the corotation region. Probably the most important families are all there. And you just take all these manifolds, all these upper centers, essentially, and plot them together. And this gives you exactly the picture that I was showing uh, three or four transparencies before. And that essentially gives you what in dynamical systems theory is typically called the heteroclinic and homoclinic tangle. So let's say the oscillations created by these structures, oscillations with respect to the same manifold or uh, with respect one with respect to the other are just caused by the fact that the unstable manifolds of one family cannot intersect with the unstable manifolds of another family. So when you put them all together, they cannot intersect. At any point, if you check carefully this, this picture here, you will not find that any two of them intersect with each other. And so what it means is that when you plot them all together, they just create some preferential structure in phase space and just enhance the density locally very much. And the easiest way to see that is what some people call Lagrangian coherent structures. I mean, there, there, has been, there have been, I've seen papers on that. I mean, about manifold theory in galaxies, actually. And uh, well, the easiest way to understand it is that you don't need even to compute the periodic orbits. You don't need to compute the manifolds. You don't need to know much about dynamical systems theory at all. I mean, just take a chunk of matter, let's say, I mean, a ball of initial conditions around the L1. I mean, randomly choosing initial conditions forming a, a ball in, in phase space and propagate them numerically. And they will all go and do more or less the same thing like the manifolds themselves. So you see, essentially what you get from this manifold is this particular kind of oscillatory, chaotic motion, let's say in phase space that then you can always translate, of course, to, to, to the natural space where you, where you observe the system. And uh, so essentially you get just the same picture without any, any specific calculation. Just take an ensemble of initial conditions in the neighborhood of corotation, just propagate them, and you get essentially the same picture as the detailed one. So this is what I call a Lagrangian coherent structure view of the same. And that essentially means that from what regards, let's say, the understanding of these manifolds for galactic dynamics, it's, it's all very simple. I mean, it's the way the long-term propagation of the orbits around the corotation region. Just take those orbits, you integrate them, and you see what they do. So it's the natural evolution, you can say, of the outflow from the ending points of the bar. This is all that, that this picture tells you about. Okay, now you can this you can do even in a more let's say fancy way. So for example, here we take a strip of initial conditions close to a circular orbit. 
And again, you deform them. So you take all these initial conditions. This is phase phase space plot. So it's theta against angular momentum. Theta is the angle, let's say the azimuth in the, in the rotating frame. So you just get a strip of initial conditions. You propagate them. They give the same thing. And if you take initial conditions for the circular orbit at different energies, you can even create a full response model in the, in the again, in the way indicated by, by the paper of Patsis in 2006. So you can just put from different energies, you can just put orbits which are initially in, a, in nearly circular orbits, just propagate them in the potential. And again, they follow the same Lagrangian structures. So again, you get, uh, let's say, these spirals. That, so there is nothing really there other than the fact that the chaotic structures formed at corrotation indicate a guideline, a guide through which, let's say, along which, if you like, uh, all the chaotic trajectories necessarily have to move. That's, this is the basic sense out of that. Okay, that's all quite okay, but if you now go to really check what happens in more detailed models, so let's say you want now to figure out what happens uh, what happens if you go, for example, to an n-body simulation that, that is no longer a static bar, is no longer a unique pattern speed, is none of that. And just to show one here, I hope I can make it happen. Well, this is a classical stellar dynamical simulation. So you have only only stars and you can see, I mean, it's a Q equals one. So cold and unstable initial. You have an initial phase. You can see, I mean, the bar is formed. I mean, at the beginning you have normal spirals and transient spirals, and then you have the bar. And then you have this ejection essentially of material. When you, when you watch it just by eye, you never see any uh, let's say long lived in the sense that you can, it's always there with a constant amplitude uh, spiral structure. I mean, all that you see is essentially uh, that they, they just, you just create them and then they appear and disappear as if they are, there are episodes of spiral activity, as if the, as if the material here you have a first, a second, a third and a fourth, and again a fifth, and so on. So you have some burst of this activity. And of course, as you can, you can always check that if you move on in time, it gets weaker and weaker. And this is all due to the fact that the simulation is purely stellar. So then the system becomes hotter and the velocity dispersion increases. And this can persist for something like four giga years, as we were also listening this, this morning. But if you add, probably if you add some dissipation, you can make it more persistent. But altogether, let's say just with the stars, you get something that gets fainter in time all the time. Okay. Uh, so now I go back to the presentation. The, uh, Now, so this is just a snapshot of this evolution. I mean, this is just the first burst that you saw. After it happens probably immediately after the 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 bar formation, and, and it has several interesting features. I mean, this this let's say simulation here. I mean, individual snapshots and the overall time, let's say evolution. Uh, well, the first thing is that okay, if you just make a kind of a Fourier measurement of the pattern speed of the bar. So you, you just create a model, a temporary model in which you just fix the value of the pattern speed and you just plot, compute the potential, but this is done with a grid code. So you can easily get the potential and you can interpolate the potential so you can have trajectories and all kinds of dynamical studies that you're interested in. So then you do that and you compute the Lyapunov families and you compute the manifolds of the families and you superpose them at this snapshot with the image of the, 
of the of the of the disk as given by the particles essentially you you say okay the theory in general works i mean i'm probably i'm able to recognize here many secondary features we've given names to those features so you can see the first return the fact that the manifolds that emanate from one of the Lagrangian points, make some oscillations and then return to the, to the vicinity of the other Lagrangian point. So this is called the bridge. And also when they do that, let's say between these bridges, like here, let's say on top, for example, there are gaps created. And each of these gaps, you can see it in configuration space, in the natural space, let's say, of, of the particles. But you can also see it in phase space. So you can, you can go back to the manifolds, draw them in phase space, and figure out what is precisely the feature in phase space that gives you the bridge, what is precisely the other one that gives you the gap, and so on and so forth. So you can say, OK, when I look to this snapshot, uh, it looks quite OK. But in reality, I mean, this is probably a bit uh, let's say misleading in the sense that this model is full of any kind of evolution within the disk of the bar itself, actually. Now, if, I don't know if you noticed before in the, in the video, I mean, you could see, for example, the creation, the gradual creation of a peanut, the slowdown of the bar. Okay, so you, there is the bar itself, the potential given by the bar changes, okay, changes in its radial extent, the changes also in the vertical structure. So there is, there is nothing, nothing very constant there. Uh, well, one of the things, if you, if you do this a bit more carefully, you discover that actually uh, the manifolds, I mean, that up to now were just regarded like a static theory. I mean, give me a pattern speed and I will figure out what it is. Uh, can even fuel somehow these cycles of spiral activity. And I, I want to explain this a bit because this is, this is crucial for what follows. So let's say here you see uh, the bar spin down. This is an estimate of the evolution of, of a pattern speed with time. And uh, well, it's not, it's not monotonous. I mean, you have oscillations, but on top of that, you can put something like an exponential decay, so, so to speak, in a fitting law or something. And uh, well, the, the, all the resonances, the radii of the resonances move outwards, and all of that happens during the, the bar evolution. But there are more things which happen. So first of all, if you just Fourier analyze the amplitudes of the, of the basic modes, Let's say outside the bar, outside the rotation, essentially, you figure out nearly immediately the oscillations in the uh, spiral activity that we called before bursts. So let's say sometimes it goes up, sometimes it goes down, and it seems all to happen in an oscillatory manner. So you see, there is no constant spiral amplitude. It goes up, it goes down. But when you look to this plot, you can say there is a period approximate period by which this happens. And it's interesting. You can try probably to fit it with the period of the bar, but you know the uncertainty is about whenever you try to figure out if there is any commensurability between pattern speeds. I mean, given you always fall into the errors of the estimates. I mean, you could, within with each error, you could imagine any kind of commensurability that you like. So it's not very safe to do that. On the other hand, what you can see in this model, is that these oscillations here appear to be correlated somehow in oscillations in M equals one. And actually, we, uh, which gives you the primary asymmetry in the spirals, which you observe in the, in, in the simulation. So now we, we figured out, actually, we, we, we discussed this in, in, a, in a paper uh, three years ago. And uh, well, we figured out that what essentially happens here is that uh, when, when you have a strong, let's say, phase, phase of a strong m equals two, then many stars just following the manifolds are attracted, so they move along the manifolds. And what they do by that is that some of them just escape. So the system loses loses mass and uh, probably loses a bit of angular momentum in this way altogether, let's say, out of these stars. But the escape is not 
perfectly symmetric. And this is just a consequence of being of trajectories being chaotic. So you can have just for statistical reasons, you can have a bit more of stars, let's say, escaping along the along the m equals two with respect to the m uh, one of the branches of the m equals two spirals than the other branch. Let's say so you just you just get this by by fluctuations, and these fluctuations are small. I mean, but it's just normal noise, no, no more than that, and it creates a small effect which is however it turns to be interesting so what it creates is a small rebound of the disk so together with angular momentum there is a linear momentum transfer just by the asymmetry and then the disk rebounds a bit how how bit i mean this is let's say about uh well this is in the scale of 0 0.3 you can see kiloparsec so this is the relative orbit that the disk center of mass has with respect to the halo center because the halo is life is nothing rigid i mean it's a, probably one of the biggest mistakes you can do in this kind of let's say analysis is to set the fix the center of a system because then you lose all these phenomena altogether you lose many phenomena by this way now if you have this small separation you can now make a back to the envelope calculation to figure out that small as it might be it causes a tidal small tidal response let's say that just the separation of the two centers and this response is m equals two actually this comes directly from tidal theory so then you excite essentially an m equals two uh, perturbation in the disk just by separating slightly by something of the order of 100 parsecs or so the center of the disk from the center of the halo which looks like a minimal effect altogether well these effects happen again and again so you can see you start with a trajectory it makes one episode then tends to slow down go back to the center so the two centers would get aligned but then new stars along the spiral arms make a second phase of excitation then it turns down again go down to the center and keep on exciting decaying exciting decaying and so on okay so nevertheless you could always say okay let me uh forget about all that and try nevertheless to draw the manifolds with the classical definition no multiple pattern speeds no time variations of the amplitude what would they get and the picture which you get i mean all those this phenomena taken into account is not so bad I mean, here you have, I will just show you again some snapshots of the same simulation together with what you get by a static representation of the manifolds. And by static here, I mean, again, with just the one classical pattern speed model. But notice, however, these uh, panels too. Now, these panels give you a brute force measurement of uh, the pattern speed across, let's say, the whole disk, which is not taken by a Fourier analysis, but by just saying how much in angle where the maxima of the density uh, shifted by, let's say, one uh, time step separating each snapshot from the, from the next one. So you just measure the difference in angle between the maxima. Let's say along concentric rings, and this gives you an estimate that is well does not it does not depend on any choice of particular Fourier mode. It's very brute force, but still gives you some information. Okay, so let's look what it gives. So again, here you have okay, it's everything reversed, so it returns clockwise rather than counterclockwise. But anyway, so you can see now check just by naked eye, you can see it goes quite okay. I mean just. Just this theory compared to what we see here, I mean, many oscillations, where the minima are, where the maxima are, how much of a return we have, uh, what, how much of a bridge I have, and so on. So you can take all these pictures one by one and figure out that it's not so bad altogether. I mean, there are clearly things that are not understandable. I mean, we, I don't think we see very well this, for example, structure here. Clearly, there are things that you don't see well here. 
But probably what is more interesting is that when you try to define now this pattern speed in this brute force method, there are patterns where you, you are, there are instances where you can do it nicely and other ones when you lose the information completely. So for example, take this one. So in this one, if you just assume that these structures here, whatever you call them, just rotate and you make computation of the pattern speed by just measuring out how, how much of an angle they did in time delta t, you figure out that you get a meaningless mean curve. And there is, there is no answer. You don't find anything out of that. And there are other snapshots where you see two pattern speeds. So there are ones in which you see a pattern speed that you can say, okay, that's one is for the bar and there is another one for something outside. Then you see other ones in which probably there tends to be a kind of uh, torsion around the disc or twist, if you like, okay? There, is, there are no well-formed plateaus in an area. And you move again, and there you see another plateau probably is being formed. And you move on, and you see that between the two plateaus, there is a fuzzy area that you, I mean, you don't know what it is, essentially. And altogether, you do this exercise again and again, snapshot after snapshot, and you figure out that general, let's say, picture is that if I just take the mere original manifold theory and plot these manifolds in comparison with a picture of the galaxy, that gives me something which at first sight looks quite okay. And even probably able to interpret at least qualitatively several of these figures. But if I go and check, but is it really that simple model that I have, then at least starting from the two basic quantities which you would like to keep constant, which is the amplitude of the perturbation and the, and the pattern speed, that you wouldn't get, okay? So you have this situation, and now we, we need to try to understand how can it be to reconcile, essentially, these two different viewpoints. Okay, so now to do that, I will return to this classical, by now, let's say, viewpoint of, again, of uh, Selwood and Spark that was mentioned this morning also by Professor Contopoulos. And, uh, uh, well, probably uh, most of us know this, this, these pictures. They just, what they tell you is that if you, if you make an end body simulation in which by Fourier, essentially, you are able to see the two different pattern speeds. So you see, you see, there is one region of one value of the pattern speed and another one of a lower value of the pattern speed. And then you say, but how do these, this, uh, let's say, structures look in, for example, as regards the isophotes? I mean, would I see the second pattern rotating from the in a clear in a way clearly different than the first pattern. Of course, uh, well, here you have the answer, and it's true. I mean, you can see there are moments when they seem to detach from the other. But altogether, the, the first remark is that most of the time you would get the impression that the, the end of the bar marks the beginning of the spiral. So as if there was a morphological continuum. But this actually is an illusion. And this you can, you can see it very clearly. If you just go to the same, let's say, experiment, you just forget now about the end-body surface density and just put a theoretical model, let's say two, de two surface density terms, one static, that gives the bars essentially isophotes together just rotating with one pattern speed. And on top of that, you superpose, just superpose by simple addition, no dynamics, no response, nothing. You just plot the sum of the two isophotes together. And now you can see that the, the image is not really, really very different from what you would get in the real embodied simulation. Of course, you miss by doing this way, by merely adding the two structures, you just write down the, the lowest order linear, let's say, superposition that doesn't take into account any response effect, has no, no dynamics. But altogether, you will, you will see that uh, you will not get pictures that are very different for most of the time from the 
uh, from the idea that the, the spirals just get start where the bar ends. And that gives a morphological, let's say, impression that the spirals are bar driven, we usually call it. But it's not, we should always take into account that in the human, not a morphological consequence, it's a dynamical one. So what we saw there is that the reason why the manifold theory claims that the bar drives, let's say, the spiral activity is not due actually to just the fact that the spirals begin in the end of the bar, but because the bar creates a skeleton of trajectories along which the spiral, the particles that support the spirals will have to move. So it's a clearly dynamic, clearly a dynamical connection. It's not a morpholo just a morphological one. Okay, so now we said, okay, if you go to a model like that, we want to make this a bit more precise. And now I come probably to the, to the core point, which is the multiple pattern speed. So you say now, if I go to this model with two sup the superposition of two modes, no interaction in the imposed potential, and I try to say, what will they give me like trajectories? How, what, how, how will the system react? So you just write down the, the potential essentially, and you say, I have a bar potential. I pass to the rotating frame of the bar already. So up to here, there is nothing else than classical stuff. And to that one, I will assume the existence of extra terms, which represent some mode that was put there by hand essentially, rotating with a different pattern speed that I choose for the moment I choose at will, and then we'll see what happens. So I just get that thing written down here, and I try to figure out what will happen to all one by one, all the basic structures that lead to the creation of the manifold. So we have seen three so far. One was what will happen to the unstable equilibria? The second is what will happen to the trajectories around the epicyclic one, around the unstable equilibria. And the third one is what will happen to the manifolds. And for all three of them, uh, there is a useful analogy, again, drawn from the circular restricted three body problem, or if you like better, the passing from the circular to the elliptic restricted three body problem. Just imagine, this classical situation, you have, let's say, Sun, Jupiter, but instead of putting Jupiter in a circular orbit around the Sun, you put it in an elliptic orbit around the Sun. Now, this elliptic orbit has a frequency, and you can choose to rotate with that frequency. You pass to a rotating frame, uniform. But in that one, since Jupiter's rotation is no longer uniform, you will see Jupiter itself making an epicycle. When Jupiter will go a bit faster than average when it is close to pericenter, and it's going to be a little slower than average when it goes to upper center. So when you look at it in the rotating frame, you just get a Ptolemaic epicycle. Okay. So if you now go back to this rotating frame and add the fact that Jupiter is not precisely at a point, but it is on a circle, you introduce an extra frequency. But it was known already to Lagrange 250 years ago that this extra frequency can be absorbed by a transformation. Actually, in celestial mechanics, we call it the transformation to the pulsating and non-uniformly rotating reference frame. It's, it's classical stuff. So you know that you can imagine that instead of moving to a rotate frame of reference moving, you, uh, let's say rotating uniformly, you just adapt your angular speed to always follow Jupiter. And since the distance between Jupiter and, and Sun is not always the same and changes also in time, you just rescale your coordinates. Sometimes you make it a bit longer and sometimes you make it a bit shorter. Okay, so you just absorb the time dependence by a transformation of coordinates. And when you do that, it was known to Lagrange that you recover still the existence in this pulsating and non-uniformly rotating system. You have again equilibria, the classical uh, collinear equilibria. You have L1, you have L2. 
And then you can always back transform this equilibria to the original coordinate system and introduce all the frequencies back, all the frequencies which you omitted by the original transformation. So this equilibria transform like periodic orbits. So essentially what you do by that mechanism is you increase the dimensionality of all the objects by one. So let's say the equilibria of the circular problem will become periodic orbits in the, in the elliptic. And the periodic orbits of the elliptic problem, which were the Lyapunov orbits, will become Lissajou so-called orbits or two-dimensional tori. I mean, you can have a technical name for them. So everything can be translated by just making this transformation of variables. And now the question is, how do you do it, this transformation of variables? So just to cut this long story short. So you go back to your the theory, which we have developed a couple of years ago with Mirella Harsula and Professor Kontopoulos was one based essentially on a very simple kind of canonical transformation. So essentially what you say is that it's, it's a theory which is local. So it only holds for the neighborhood of the Lagrangian points, but it's all you need because what will, will that theory gives you is just the starting point of the manifolds in the generalized picture. And once you have that, you compute these quantities, then you can propagate these quantities numerically and you get the full picture. So the theory essentially tells you the following. If you pass, if you diagonalize, let's say the motion around the L1 problem of the bar, just the bar, then the Hamiltonian of the motion looks, takes the form of an oscillator, this term K over kappa over two Q square plus P square, which just describes the epicyclic oscillation plus a hyperbolic oscillator, something that gives an exponential deviation away from L1. And this is just, this just corresponds to the, uh, uh, to the, to the exponential motion. I don't know what happened here. Uh, we lost the, Minimize, can I do this? Left click. Ah, here, okay. Oh, I go here. So, uh, so what you get, back this one. So what you get is, an oscillator, and this describes just the epicyclic oscillations we were speaking about before, plus an exponential, essentially, uh, let's say, motion away from the equilibrium, like a hyperbolic motion. And this expresses the fact that the guiding center of all these epicycles moves away. So essentially this gives you the classical picture that you have, let's say at the beginning, you have the manifold being very close to the epicyclic orbit itself. But then as the guiding center goes faster and faster, you reach a point in which you no longer form even a circle. From there on, the motion becomes essentially cycloid. And this gives you the classical picture of the manifold. So this is for the bar system. But now, because we have the extra speeds, this is not gonna be an equilibrium of the total system. And this fact in this, let's say, expansion of the Hamiltonian is just represented by the fact, by a very, let's say, little detail, the fact that some exponents here can just give a sum equal to one. So let's say in this polynomial, you have exponents that sum up to unit one, just in linear terms. So if you just imagine a nonlinear transformation that absorbs these terms, you end up, you can see it here. So instead of starting from one, you just start from two in this little sum, this little detail, you end up with that transformation, reestablishing the existence of equilibria in the new variables. So this transformation essentially gives you the interface. So you have the numerical algorithm essentially tells you, compute the transformation is something not so difficult to be done. 
and then go to the new variables, get your L1 there, generalized L1, and then back transform to the original variables, and that will give you a periodic orbit. Now do the same for the manifolds of L1 in the new variables, back transform, and that will give you the beginning of the manifolds for that periodic orbit. And so in this way, you can always propagate these manifolds and get the picture with multiple pattern speeds. Okay, where does this lead? Just to give you an idea, this is an application in a Milky Way-like model. Just, I don't enter into details. This is the picture which you get from the pure bar model. You can see this is a rotation curve, sum of various components. These are the Q strengths. And this is just the manifolds which you would have had you not considered the second pattern at all. But now, if you go and do all this business that I was telling you, I mean, you just go to add the, the potential terms corresponding to a second pattern, compute the generalized coordinates, compute the equilibria, compute the manifolds, go back to the original coordinates, translate the results, and so on. What you see that it happens is that essentially these manifolds over time, they just breathe. So they don't don't change so much. So essentially what happened here is that this, this second perturbation that was time dependent was introduced in the manifold picture, just like an oscillation with a certain frequency. But the main picture, the skeleton that was provided by the bar itself will not essentially change. Okay, I want to, to do this now, and this is my last transparencies which refers to actually to the, to the work of, uh, of uh, Costantina Zulumi, the PhD work of Costantina. What will happen if I try to repeat the exercise in the case of the end body model that they were showing at the beginning? So now you put everything together, okay? And the story now goes as follows. Okay, you have to say, I had a spin down of the bar. So by how many kilometers per second per kiloparsec, about eight in a period of 1.5 giga years, let's say in this plot, maybe a little less. So, well. But this change is itself comparable to the, to the error that I would have had I implemented the Fourier transform method to compute the pattern speeds because for computing this pattern speeds, you need a time series. So you need to get the M equals two amplitudes of a time in a set of data. How long should that set of data be? It should be several periods, let's say, of the pattern that you're looking for. So you have, let's say, five periods, four periods, and so on, you get a certain error. The longest your time series, the smallest the error. Essentially, the error in the Fourier method goes like one over T, where T is the length of the time series. So if you have, in, at the same period, you have a com comparable in size change of the pattern speed of the bar itself, the method becomes inefficient. So the, the way that we go over that is by using an algorithm introduced by Lascar called the analysis of the fundamental frequencies. So essentially what you do here, I don't enter into detail, is that instead of Fourier transforming your data, you look for the maximum of certain integrals given by your time series with respect to a parameter, sigma, that essentially represents values of the frequency where you tune to the maximum of a certain mode. Okay, now this method is well explained in several papers. The, its main advantage is that it allows you to specify the frequencies with the precision, not one over t, but one over t square. So essentially, you work with series much shorter in time series. You can still get the result that represents a fundamental frequency. So you get a better description of the frequencies by just using this NAF process. Okay, this you can see here, for example. You can see in various times windows how you have a one frequency of the bar and the other one. Now this is in the secularly evolving system. So you can see all the, all the frequencies go down in time. So you see the slowdown of all the patterns. 
And uh, it, if you just make an analysis by different uh, uh, radia, uh, let's say annuli, you can figure out that actually there are even more than two modes in this problem. And quite often you see three modes and one of them becomes dominant and so on. But our process just uses two of them. So we just check with two, two models. We check that the, 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 let's say the frequency analysis correctly eliminates the plus in this term for the bar. I mean, this, there is a check that some terms should ideally be equal to zero just by balancing of some coefficients. And this happens quite happily. And here you have the computation of the uh, generalized Lyapunov orbits in this problem just by implementing the nav. So then you see that these orbits can be quite strange. These are the orbits that generalize the point L1s, but whenever you plot their manifolds, like here, you now get an even better representation of what you see in the picture of the galaxy. Let's say in this simulation, essentially, you repeat the theory, but with moving time windows that allow you now to fit way better the features that you see uh, that you see in the real pictures, let's say, of the, of the embodied simulation. And this is the last probably result. Here you see the velocity flow that follows the prediction of the manifold theory in this system. And, uh, well, I will skip that one, which was essentially the, the discussion about the comparison with real galaxies. And so I go to the conclusion so the manifold modeling, probably this is the main message to retain of spiral structure gives a simple mechanism for understanding how motions which are chaotic when regarded, let's say individually, end up creating a coherent flow. Probably this is the main message as I understand it at least of the manifold theory. I mean, it's, there's nothing particular about about flux tubes or apocentric manifolds. There is nothing particular about those emanating from L1 or L2 or another periodic orbit. What really matters in this construction is the skeleton that you create in phase space that eventually puts all the chaotic orbits coming from different neighborhoods to collaborate and create this kind of coherent chaotic flow. And okay, we, we get out of all these studies in the past, several morphologies, and we probably now have an answer to the fact that there is nothing special about assuming a unique pattern speed, because there is no connection of the manifolds with the bars by the mere fact that the manifolds seem quite often to emanate from the end of the bar. But the connection in reality is just dynamical, not morphological. And this can be analyzed with the help of a couple of steps in perturbation theory. And I will close with a final remark that in, uh, probably this is more general if you like, when we speak about spiral structures, all this, let's say, discussion we have, there are two ways of speaking. I mean, there is a way of speaking using Boltzmann's equation, densities, waves, wave equation, linear, nonlinear, and so on. I will call it a collective way of speaking. I mean, you, you look to the density. And there is another one based on the Lagrangian dynamics, if you like. I mean, this is trajectories. So these two viewpoints are complementary. So what I suspect the, here is that many mechanisms that we discuss as a easy and possible plausible explanation of the burst, for example, of spiral activity from the point of view of the collective theory, like swing amplification we saw today, would be perfectly consistent, although, of course, this has remained to be shown, with the orbital counterpart, which in the case of Barth galaxies is given by the manifold theory. And I think with this remark, I will stop here. So thank you. And Thank you much, Christos, for this talk. Uh, too many things to <laughs> to combine in uh, 
understanding uh, the spiral structure in the bar spiral case. Uh, questions. Uh, first of all, if there is a question in the in the room here, so can I please use? Uh, hi, um, nice talk. I wanted to understand. Uh, so this manifold spiral works with the bar in bar potential. So uh, what about the galaxies without the bar? Would you? Well, it's. Uh, thank you for this question. Well, in theory, no. I mean, you need chaos. If you take a perfectly normal galaxy, let's say, you would probably not have. You could have some non-linearity, which is mostly expressed by this deformation of the periodic orbits, which you get with respect mm -hmm. to ellipses as you move outwards. So you don't get much of chaos, though. Mm -hmm. On the other hand, the question becomes really interesting. When you go to a galaxy, I would say, actually, the Milky Way case is quite puzzling. Because in the Milky Way case, and this is probably something that Mirella Harsula will speak about, if you try to regard the things from both viewpoints, you sometimes you get meaningful results. So just to, to, to make it a bit more clear, let's say if you have a very fast rotating bar, I mean, it all depends a bit on the, on the speeds, okay? When you have a fast rotating bar, Chaos is not going to be up to, from a certain point on, it's not going to be so much because essentially the rest of the system, the disk, follows that. Just what just sees the average of the bar. I mean, the bar starts looking like a bulge. So, dynamically, you could say, can I create, uh, uh, let's say, a, a normal theory of spirals with regular orbits? And the answer is yes. I mean, we have models of this type. Now, you slow down the bar or you change the ratio between the two pattern speeds. I mean, typically this is related to the question I was asking before. I mean, you can probably try to switch the inner Limbland resonance of the spirals with the corrotation of the bar and the outer Limbland resonance of the bar with the four to one of the, uh, of the yeah, with the four, four to one of the spirals. I mean, you can try to make this kind of matching of the frequencies. And depending on how you do that, quite often you get models, regular models that work quite well, and chaotic ones over different, let's say, values of the pattern speed that work equally well. So I would say probably uh, for many galaxies, the key to an answer to that question is given by the basic parameters, which are the pattern speeds themselves and the relative amplitudes between the bar and the spiral mode. So for the same model, I mean, looking morphologically the same, you could have quite different answers depending on what you choose as parameter values for those two things. Okay, thanks. Uh, just uh, one quick question uh, again. Um, so with the um, in the manifold theories, can you also create, because I believe this is based on a, the potential that you put in by hand, but what about the outcome of the spiral as a trailing versus the leading? What, decide, what decides, I mean, what kind of spiral structure you create in the manifold? Trailing versus leading? Trailing or leading, you talk yeah. about? Yeah, okay. and what it depends no, no, on. That's very simple. Actually, when you compute the, this, you can in, understand intuitively, the stars away from, from corrotation, uh, look just by differential rotation, look retrograde. The, or the circular, the nearly circular orbits are retrograde when you are away beyond L1, and they are prograde when you are inside L1. Yes. So if you take this now and um, transform it into an analysis of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, you quite easily figure out that the eigenvectors pointing in the directions of the unstable manifold, the flux tubes, let's say, are always trailing. So you have a quick answer to that. There's no, no possibility to get any leading structure out of that. Thanks. Okay. Uh, I don't see anybody else in the room who wants to ask something. So we go to uh, participants of our Zoom. So please, uh, Wilma Trick, go on with your question. And then we come to this one. Hello, thank you for this amazing talk. Um, I think the manifold theory is really so beautiful. Um, 
I have one question and and that's basically related to one of the points that you made also that basically spiral arms are a statistical density phenomenon but um, the physics is happening in the individual orbits uh, and we need to connect this just as you said in your um, summary so you showed at the beginning um, like this plot from one of the Romero Gomez Athanasula papers with um, the end body simulation where they trace some of the orbits and show that the manifold orbits agree with the location of the spiral arms. But I wonder if, if they or you or we as a science community actually ever have made um, I like the one with the sorry, the one with the end body simulation, like in blue and green. Right. Uh, <laughs> no, no, you just had it there for a quick second and now it's gone again. That one. Exactly. Thank you. Um, did, did anyone ever make like um, a statistical study if it's really the manifold orbits that dominate in the spiral arms, like in, in terms of mass? Okay, you mean the, ma the total mass in the spiral or where up to a certain, let's say, what is the extent of the, the angular extent of the spiral, let's say? And no, if like, like it looks like there is a spiral structure in the surface density of stars. Yeah. And do the manifold orbit stars dominate in terms of numbers? Yeah, well, actually what you... It was a plot that was shown in this morning because actually the manifolds, since the manifolds are, are curves, I mean, they are geometric curves, the, the, it's not so easy to, let's say, to say, to you, how do you populate them? I mean, to get to what you, you're meaning. But there are two things which you can do and have both been done. So one of the things is to check how many particles there are in those Jacobi energies which correspond to the manifolds. So you look at it in energy space, and this is a plot that I have here. So uh, maybe it's this one. I don't know. Wait, but okay. So it's this one here, as you can see. So, and out of that, of those plots, I mean, here you have how many plots, you, how many particles you have in those energies where the manifolds exist, you get quite meaningful numbers. And then you need to involve an indirect argument, which was precisely the, res the argument on the response that I was speaking at the beginning. So that this these particles in particular are now distributed along the manifold structures. Now, on the other hand, as regards uh, what extent they go, I mean, if you get something open or closed or quarter turn, or they make uh, oscillations and any of this type, uh, it seems that we are able, let's say in a statistical sense, you are able to get any kind of morphologies of this type that you, that you want. So for example, if you just look at the same simulation uh, at different time snapshots, you can probably recognize different different morphologies and even asymmetries and so on and so forth. I would say, I would say that for for strong bar perturbations, there is a study at least of the pitch angle correlation with bar strength. And what you can see here uh, is that when you get this, can I close this or? <laughs> uh, so when you look at it in this space, you have pitch angle. Here, here actually is the pitch angle uh, between uh, the spiral arms and uh, the pitch angle between the, let's say, the, how much symmetric or asymmetric they are. And then you have all these kind of correlations have been studied. And the general conclusion is that the strongest the bar perturbation, the more open the, the manifolds tend to be. I think this is this is probably a more general conclusion you can get. So when when the amplitude of the bar is smaller, you tend to get rings, and otherwise you tend to get open spirals and so on. Okay, I think we have also a technical problem. Maybe we have to close the connection in five minutes. Maybe not. I'm not sure from the messages I see on the screen. So please let's do the two other questions, Francesca first, and then uh, Merce. After that, Francesca, please go ahead. Yes. So, um, thanks, thanks for the great talk, Christo. That was, was very interesting. 
Um, I have many questions, but okay, in the in the uh, sake of time, I'll, I'll just ask one. So I was really interested in um, what you were talking about, the breathing manifolds, when you have multiple patterns. So I'm wondering in this case, I mean, can you walk me walk us again a little bit about what is happening to the manifold tubes that are emanating from the Lyapunov orbits in this scenario? So are the should I be imagining that the Lyapunov orbits are distorted somehow in phase space when you have these two patterns? And how exactly is this giving rise to this breathing mode? I mean, they get distorted, but but little. I mean, if you try to observe, let's say to say. Is it meaningful? Is it very significant? I mean, by naked eye, quite often you say, okay, what I see here is about the same, the same kind of shape always. If you check more carefully with, uh, you know, analyzing the density maxima and so on, essentially you figure out that the most probably locally, at least the only change you will see is a slight change in the pitch angle, maybe. So it becomes, sometimes it becomes shorter and sometimes it becomes a bit longer in a periodic way but you don't see a spectacular change. You see a small change altogether. So is it this change in the pitch angle that gives this appearance of a breathing pattern in the spiral and a disconnection and connection to the bar ends, let's say? Ah, okay, that's more interesting. This we have done, uh, maybe you can see it here. It, there, is a, there is something very interesting here. Uh, when you do it, uh, let's say with at least with a strong case, a strong spiral case, essentially you typically get that in the middle of the relative period, this T, T capital here is the relative period, the difference between the two pattern speeds. Uh, so in the middle of that period, you do not have a very good agreement altogether with the imposed spiral. So probably you there is something here to be understood. So in general, you have that the worst connection between what you get like a response out of the manifolds and what you imposed by this pattern speed is precisely in the middle of this circle, which actually corresponds to the point when, when uh, in the physical space, you would see them disconnected from the, from the bar. Okay, thank you. Which paper is this? Can you uh, tell me again? This one is the one of 2020. I mean, you cannot see it here because it's it's one of uh, Harsula, Ephthimiopoulos, and Kondopoulos in astronomy and astrophysics. It's just he written but hidden by the. Okay, 2020. Great. Thank thank you very much. Thanks. Oh, Merce, your question. No, it was an answer to to Wilma. Sorry, because I do not have a very good connection, and I have written it in the in the chat. So I think it helps. Uh, sorry, I lost the last part because here there are messages popping up. Can you please repeat the last question? I, I was answering Vilma's question on the statistical study on the particles trapped in a manifold in an embodied simulation. We are doing this work with a PhD student and yeah. we, are, we have a draft paper. So we are precisely doing this quantification. That's very nice. That's very nice. If you have the reference, Marcel, maybe you can mention the reference if you have already there or it's a work in progress. It's, it's work in progress. Uh, hopefully will come out soon, but it's the work of a PhD student and uh, as soon as we have it, we will, we will make it available. Maybe you mentioned the name of the student. Uh, yeah. Yes, it is uh, Victor, um, Victor Padura in the Complutense, University of Complutense of Madrid. It's a work in collaboration with Santi Roca Fabra and, uh, and mine. Great. Okay, thank you. So, uh, okay, okay, we, we, we have time. I was afraid for a while that because this uh, note that uh, could the Zoom connection be closed, but uh, it's not the case. So, so, so we have some more time. If someone else want to, to ask a question, Please. Uh, okay, one question from Marthus Katsanikas. Technical question is uh, from the viewpoint of dynamical systems. For the computation of manifolds, in the last case, with two pattern speeds, maybe it was easier, I don't know if it's, uh, uh, to use a method that uh, does not need the, the computation of periodic orbits. For example, Lagrangian descriptors or other methods that... Uh, Absolutely. Well, if you want to do it with Lagrangian descriptors, it's possible. 
If you want to do it numerically in the Newton Raphson way, let's say compute the periodic orbit and the eigenvalues and so on, uh, the problem you have is that the spa phase space is so chaotic that you don't know what to put as an initial condition. So typically what we do, what for example, Costantina did in her thesis is that we take the, the the Fourier amplitudes that the the NAF gave us and artificially reduce them by a factor 100. I mean, we just do it by hand, and that gives a model that has essentially no perturbation, very very small perturbation, and we do the perturbation theory there, and we get by the theory we get good initial conditions so that the Newton Raphson gives the orbit. Then you repeat it for a couple of points and then doing extrapolation in the usual way, you can start now increasing numerically the amplitude and get your, your periodic orbit up to any value of the amplitude that you like. So it's a well-known technique. I mean, artificially reduce the perturbation, get your periodic orbit to the point where you, you're able to do it numerically and then start little by little increasing the amplitude so you can follow the family up to the end, up to the amplitude that you are interested in. So this is how we do it. Okay, we can continue the discussion in the evening session. Uh, of course, maybe we have to stop. Uh, thanks, uh, uh, Christos, again for this talk. Uh, we'll continue the discussion during the following talks at, uh, at the end of the meeting. If you, if you want, we can stay uh, more time here. Uh, we make our lunch break here. It, uh, we are totally out of time, but maybe that's uh, that's that's good because we had uh, things to discuss. And we are back at uh, three o'clock Greek time to continue. Okay.